every home off of it, right? So we're coming up with these hills and we're gonna so um, retaining walls in the plan set. Another one with the detention ponds. Because it I thought it was measured off the center line. Big mouse. Do you or a flag lot? That a yeah, this is essentially fungus spring. Maybe Clint can talk about that. Uh, yeah, we're we're agreeing. Lots and agreements, or that do they think compromises are between those two grades? Unity. So I think conditions and those were things that we would need to address. So and, and I appreciate it all or hundred foot wide. Uh, granted, uh, it's up to you guys to make a move. I'm just wondering the following adjustments to be adjusted. To also, and this is a really important people in this position, but we did a couple of different zones, R210 and the MU. And because we would recommend that, that lot two is provided. When our construction. So there's an extension at the old city. All right. Um, any motion by Brody? Okay. Maybe next time we meet uh, as you work through things. Well, as we've done, it sounds like there's probably two. All the city staff come up to the podium. Andrea, Andrea, are you good with Jackson, Adam, and Brody? Um, and as you can see, we have a couple of them that are uh, remote that you can see on the screen. <clears throat> so at this time, we'll ask if anyone on the planning commission has any conflicts of interest for any of the items on the agenda. Um, I do have a conflict of interest in regards to the Salt Lake Community College. All right, thank you, Jackson. So are you going to abstain from voting on that item? I will abstain from voting, yes. All right, thank you so much. And we'll look for a motion now on item 2.4, which is an approval for minute of minutes for the January 21st, 2021 Planning Commission meeting. I'll make a motion to approve item 2.4. Approval of minutes for the January 21st, 2021 Planning Commission meeting. Thank you, Heather. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I see, I saw your mouth move, Adam, but you're on mute. Aye. All right, thank you. Then we'll move on to items, our administrative items, which is 3.1. I do want to go through a couple uh, just procedures. We This item is on for a public hearing today. Um, when we do the public hearing, I'm just going to read uh, our procedure. The purpose of public comment is to allow citizens to address items on the agenda. Citizens requesting to address the commission will be asked to complete a written comment form and present it to Wendy Thorpe, which is located over here. And, and the comment forms are located in the back on the table. Um, a spokesperson recognized as representing a group in attendance may be allowed up to five minutes and then an individual will be allowed up to, and I think it says three minutes here, but it is two minutes, correct, Wendy? Or is that three minutes? So three minutes. Now, oftentimes individuals that come to these meetings uh, think that it's a, a question and answer session during this. Um, it's actually just comments that you'll make to the planning commission. And then after the public hearing portion, we'll have some discussion over the comments that were made. Um, it's, it's very useful to us because sometimes uh, there's items that are addressed that we were unaware of. So we appreciate you all out here and it's actually nice seeing you all here. So we'll move on to item 3.1 at this time, which is a preliminary plot of 35 lots in Valhalla subdivision. And this one is on for a public hearing and we'll start off with city staff. Um, which is Clinton Spencer just talking about the, de the development in this project. All right. Well, I uh, certainly appreciate being here tonight with the, the commission. Um, I've been with the city now for officially a month and it's been, um, it's been very interesting. And so this, this first project has been um, certainly probably the most interesting that I've worked on so far. So uh, we're here to discuss the, uh, the Valhalla subdivision and we'll see. The applicant, uh, James Horsley, this includes about, uh, I want to say 17 and a half acres of property. This has been in the uh, process for quite a while, began in July 20, 2020 with the original application. Uh, had the, they had a community meeting to discuss the with the neighborhood, the subdivision plat, and then it went to the planning commission at, at which time uh, in September of 2020, it was continued. Uh, there was a rezone on the property from the uh, forest from the FR zone to the A1ZC, 
that was approved. And then uh, there was a resubmittal recently in February, which brings us back here today to the Planning Commission for a consideration of the preliminary plat. Yeah, excuse me. Okay, okay. You can take it off and then just make sure you wipe it down afterwards. Okay. So this is the location of the uh, of the proposed subdivision. As mentioned, it was about 17 and a half acres. There's a total of 35 lots being proposed. 31 of those lots are in the A.25 zone and then four of those lots are in the A1 ZC zone. Uh, just as a note, when that A1 zone was approved by the city, there was a zoning condition that only four lots on that property would be uh, would be allowed, and so that is what the applicant is is providing there. As we look at the um, consideration for tonight's well for this proposal, there's three things that we're looking at. Generally, the essentially the general plan compliance, uh, the zoning ordinance compliance, which includes the the zoning conditions and the hillside overlay that we'll discuss, and then engineering standard compliance as well. So we'll talk about engineering first. Um, and one of the issues that has not been uh, fully addressed yet with the applicant is, is in terms of drainage. Currently they're showing detention basins or detention ponds on lots one, 16 and 30. Uh, these ponds still need to be analyzed a little more fully by our engineering department to make sure that they're gonna work for the, for the subdivision. Uh, it may be that these lots or these um, detention areas need to be in, or enlarged which would affect the overall number of lots on the, on the property as well. So that's uh, something to be aware of as we consider this. Then the next one is there's an, an issue with um, access. There's a property on the northwest side of Salmon Way in 143rd South. Um, it, has a, it has a side entry garage. And the way that they, the subdivision is being proposed is that it would cut off access to that side entry garage. I know that the, um, the applicant, Mr. Horsley, has been in, in contact with this neighbor, and it sounds like they've come to a consensus on how to resolve this, essentially uh, leaving the existing asphalt there, and then the curb would continue straight along Solomon Way with a new drive approach that would maintain that access to the existing asphalt so that the applicant would have, or so that the owner, the homeowner there on the corner would have access to his, his side entry garage. And then that would also provide um, access to the detention area to the south of that, of that um, asphalt drive. And the next issue we'll look at is uh, in terms of hillside overlay. Uh, in the map on the right, you can see a red outline of it where the hill overlay area resides. And, um, and then as well, there's an overlay of the subdivision and you can see where the buildable lots for the, uh, those bottom three lights are, are being proposed and those are clearly out of the hillside overlay area. The hillside overlay area is where anything, is basically it's a, where the slope is 30% or greater and there are a lot of restrictions in terms of uh, how much disturbance can take place on that. There's no building that can be done. Uh, there's, you know, you can make landscaping changes but no retention walls or any kind of uh, structure would be allowed in that or major disturbance of that 30% slope. And uh, the applicant has also provided as part of their, uh, their subdivision application, uh, their own individual study, which is a little more extensive and a little more thorough in terms of where those 30% slopes actually exist, which is in that, uh, largely in that red area that's being shown on, on the map that provided by the applicant. So in terms of the hillside, um, there, the city sees no issues with the, the buildable area that the applicant is proposing. Next, as it comes to, in terms of general, general plan compliance, uh, again, in the map to the right, that green area is the general plan provision showing open space. Um, these lots have, were, were, are zoned as an A1.25 A1 and an A1 zone. So the A1 zone that was recently um, rezoned uh, from, the, from the FR zone, it does still, um, provide for larger lots that would provide for more, or more open space, uh, which would comply with, with how the general plan lays out there. Um, so in terms of compliance with the general plan, staff, to, staff does feel that the way that the subdivision is laid out with the larger lots, uh, this does uh, retain open space and complies with the general plan provisions. All right, so the, 
The next issue we'll get to is zoning compliance. Um, as mentioned before, there are four lots being proposed on the A1ZC uh, portion of this, of this subdivision. Um, all of the 8.25 lots meet minimum requirements as they're being proposed today, but there's a provision in the A1 zone that minimum lot widths be 100 feet. Currently, as they're shown, they're shown at 85 feet of lot widths. So the applicant has two options to comply with this standard. One would be to revise the subdivision layout and provide for the 100 foot um, lot widths, uh, which is measured at, at front yard setback along that, that arc. Or uh, there's another option that the applicant could pursue to seek a variance from the city to, um, because of the topography there, there might be a, there may be an option for that variance to be approved where the lots could be approved with it reduced um, lot widths is being proposed. And that is uh, one of the conditions for approval provided by staff as well. <clears throat> um, a couple of other um, just minor details that can be uh, addressed by the applicant, um, re just in terms of building envelopes, showing that those meet uh, current ordinances, uh, providing a tree planting plan that hasn't been provided. And then uh, the staff would recommend that the current cul-de-sac configuration be maintained. Uh, we know that this has been an issue with the neighbors, so we would recommend that the, the as with any changes made to the, um, made to the subdivision, that that current, well, that this current layout be maintained through that. And then the question of access for lot 17, um, we would just recommend that the applicant work with the, the homeowner to make sure that the, the homeowner does have um, adequate access to his property as that is being changed to make way for the subdivision. Um, and then I'm gonna read this and then I'm gonna turn the time over to um, Blake Thomas to kind of go walk through the, the density requirements. Um, as we consider density, requirements and the bonus density uh, that we've discussed in, in our previous meeting. Uh, in the ordinance, it states for applicants requesting a density greater than the baseline density, the planning commission shall determine whether the applicant has complied with necessary design components as set forth in the following chart and it's to determine the resulting density. So the applicant has provided some information on how they feel they meet these density requirements. Um, Blake will walk through a, a few slides to show um, what their proposal is and how the city sees that as well. And I'll turn the time over to him. Thank you, Clint. Oh, you're no, you're good. We work in next door offices, so we, we breathe on each other all day. <laughs> so um, first off, just want to start with the density criteria table is very nice because when we used to do this, when we didn't have it and everything came in at 2.5 units the acre, and then we had to work down to 1.8, that was quite awful. So it's much better having a table now that we can apply. So just going through these, the very first one we want to talk about is the system improvement or non-reimbursable offsite improvements. Um, it's how we we viewed this. And there was some good discussion in the work meeting about this, but um, for everyone that didn't hear, we can we can go through things. So the applicant's asking for this density bonus to be counted twice. Um, one of them is for the improvement of 14300 South. Um, it's an offsite improvement. And, and so that, that one was included and there was discussion. And it's as the as Clint read the, the statement, the, the planning commission does have the ultimate authority on whether these should count or not. So we're bringing it to you, um, looking at it and considering it. And so this was one where they would get the, the first 0 0.2 credit. The second 0 0.2 credit, is that the uh, when the, the subdivision was first brought in, we anticipated the stormwater would run down to six down 6600 west and dump into Rose Creek at that location. There's some property at that down in that corner that the city acquired, and we discussed landscaping that that piece of property at that location. As <clears throat> as their engineers started laying things out, they were able to take the stormwater a different direction. And so when the stormwater went out to the east and went down, um, I think it's Napper Point Way, it passes by a pond called Shoshone Pond. That pond was done by a development called Shoshone Estates that was done back during the recession time in 2009. And the development um, had some legal issues and the pond was never completed. Um, 
since that time, there's been some other developments in the area. They've all contributed money to this pond, but it's never been enough to get um, it approved by the city council and a budget to get to get landscaped. Where this one has stormwater going by the pond, the box, the stormwater box out in front of that pond has a weir in it. So when flows get high enough, some of the water enters into that pond if, if it's a big storm. And so we, we went through and calculated an aerial um, square footage percentage of how much this subdivision applies to the total contributing area of that pond. And so what we came up with, our engineering department did that, was $28,610 would be the fee to go towards landscaping that pond. And the reason we considered this one is because the city council has kind of tasked us with trying to find alternative ways to fund some of these general fund improvements. And so this was an opportunity where the development was having a, a minor impact on this pond. We could apply to get some more funding for this pond to, to landscape it. So that's, that's the reasoning behind that. And since it was a, a totally separate system and offsite improvement, we, we, we uh, entertain the idea of counting 2.2s. It's not in the ordinance stated that they can or cannot. So, so we looked at it that way. And as a side note, the, the applicant is providing on-site stormwater management. So this pond is not used by their development for anything other than pass by flow, except for when that larger flow comes, it, it may go into that pond. I have a question. Will those be landscaped? Yeah. Yeah. The, all the new ones will be re required to be landscaped. There were, there were some issues back in the recession why that pond was not finished. And so that's that's why the other pond, Shoshone, was never. But the added. detention that, or the what? Let's see, the proposed detention system that's going to be on the lots one, sixteen, and thirty. Those <clears> ones will all be completely landscaped. Yeah. Okay. Yep. The the way we we manage that now is there's a they're required to bond if they're not landscaped at the time the plat's recorded, and so the bond is an assurance that the landscaping will be completed. So the next one is the the other items we we discussed in the work meeting. Um, they did combine the two or more parcels, um, and so that that gives them 0 0.05 per unit or per acre. The half acre lots adjacent to larger parcels um, or agricultural for agricultural user zones, we discussed that one. Um, there may be a requirement to go back and um, revise or or amend the language in the ordinance to to capture the planning commissions um, at what, what you guys want in that ordinance. But the way it reads right now, um, it, it seemed to apply quite well with, you can see the half acre lots highlighted here and, and they're next to either agricultural zones or larger lots. They, the 10% of half acre lots, the way the, the code's written is that um, the half acre lots are in the project. And so the overall project, I don't think we had anticipated that that bonus, that density bonus item as having subdivisions where they crossed multiple zones. So where this one has the A1 zone and the A.25 zone, or the A, yeah, the A.25 zone, that uh, the overall project includes both of those. So they do have the four one acre lots in the, the larger zone and then the three half acre lots. So they, they, meet, they meet the 10% um, rule there. Can you explain that though? Because they're, <clears throat> They're probably looking at this and seeing that they meet 9.7, not the full 10%. Will you explain that code asks us to round up? And, and also just point out the four lots you're talking about. Yeah, so um, great questions. So that the overall project is 35 lots. And so that would, we would anticipate they'd be required to have four half acre lots and then development with that. And so in the, uh, in the 8.25 zone, they have three lots that are at least a half acre in size. Um, but in the actual code, I have it here because I, I know I won't, wouldn't be able to remember it off the top of my head. It says, in addition to providing half acre lots adjacent to existing larger lots, developing at least 10% of the lots throughout the project as half acre lots. That's straight out of the code. So throughout the project, um, down on the southeast corner of the project, you have the large two and a half acre lot with an existing home, and then you have the three long lots that are one acre each. 
So those are all half acre and larger. So those would be added to the three. So you'd have seven total lots in a 35 acre or 35 lot subdivision, which re, um, meets the 10% requirement. Does that clarify it enough, you think? Yeah, I answer. Okay. <clears throat> Then the, the last one I think we have here is the 0.1 for a 10 foot park strip behind the sidewalk um, along 6600 West. And so this one uh, is, a, is a, another opportunity for a developer to add bonus density. And this one, as we looked at it, the 6600 West is a fairly steep road and straight as it works its way down towards um, Butterfield Parkway and providing this this buffer will not only protect you know the the pedestrians and the, the drivers as they come down the road if they have an issue but it, it also protects provides an extra little buffer protection for any homes along this especially um, lot 20 would would benefit from having this buffer so we we identified that as a as a reasonable um, request from the developer to include in their bonus, uh, bonus density so one of the questions that i asked clint um today was are we requiring that on any of the other developments along 66 um if they come in they'll have that um, opportunity to add bonus density and i imagine it's an easy one for them to take advantage of so they'll they'll have that opportunity afforded to them i think one way to to maybe um identify better in the the ordinance would be to maybe make a map and show where these 10 foot buffers would be allowed and not allowed or required and not required. So right now, the way it's it's written, we, we, we've offered it just because it's been asked for and it's along a collector arterial. So, so yeah, that's how we've, we've approached that. Um, so I, I anticipate we'd, we'd see it up and down um, as people come in and wanna add a, an extra lot or into their subdivision as long as it meets the, the zoning requirements. <clears throat> and so as we looked at this, we one of the first concerns we had was, are the lots even gonna fit still with uh, the required frontage? And so as we, we calculated it up, the lots 18, 19, and 20 still do work and meet the, the requirement of the, the nine, I think it's 85 foot lot width in the 8.25 zone. So the one on the end, if you go back, does that say it's 82, lot 20? It's got a curve, so, so as, that counts. So as there's well. a yeah, the, the curve. But is that curves. not part of the 10 foot park strip where it would not be included then? They, they'd be yeah. able to take it out of the other lots. So their original plat showed did not show this, and that's where this exhibit came from. So you can see there's two lots that are 102. So they could take this the the width out of those up lots 18 19 to make it up in 20. yeah that's so we we made sure it fit there this exhibit doesn't show that it how it's really going to be configured but but it will fit on the on the final i guess plot that we would look at does it show it as 82 or does it show it at the 85. it would have to meet 85. okay no i understand that i didn't know if we had another document that showed it at the 85 already we, I don't, we don't have one that shows 85 there Okay, thank you. Okay. So in summary, you can kind of see how this uh, this all adds up at the end. And so they actually add up to 0.75, but that puts them over the, the maximum um, of the 2.5 max you can get to. So whatever one you want to look at, we always looked at it as we've been calculating it as the, the bonus density for the, the fee in lieu for the detention pond actually counts as 0.15. But if you could say the the solemn way 14300 south road also counts as 0.15 and the ponds counts as 0.2 um regardless it they they've achieved the 2.5 maximum density with this calculation and it brings it up to 32 lots and they requested 31 in the zone and then so that's that's the breakdown on that and uh and then you guys actually have the, the final determination um so just so you're aware of that if if you want to discuss that anymore we're available to to do that <clears throat> do you have any more clint okay 
Thank you, Blake. Did you want your mask? The 2018 stuff. Right, the mask police. Okay, appreciate those comments from Blake. Um, so just looking at this, and this was stated earlier, um, as, as one of the provisions for recording the plat as it's being proposed, uh, we would require a note to be placed on the plat so that the understanding is there that um, you know the applicant had to meet certain criteria to reach the, the density that he did without meeting, meeting this meet, meeting this minimum density, uh, any further subdivision of any of the lots in that subdivision would not be allowed because that would then exceed um, or it would violate the, the density requirements or the density bonuses that they were eligible for. So that's something that we would have placed on the on the plat itself and recorded as, as part of the subdivision. So um, our final recommendation is we looked at everything. There's there's a, a, a list of, of corrections and and uh, adjustments to the plat that we feel will be necessary. But with those pr proposed conditions, uh, we do feel that the proposed plat <clears throat> is compliant with the general plan and does meet the minimum zoning ordinances. And we recommend the approval of the, the Valhalla subdivision. Um, Chase, before he leaves, maybe I can snag him. I was going to have him just talk to, uh, to you just uh, quickly in the beginning of this. So this is a list of, of conditions of approval. And I know that's very hard to see from a, a lot of standpoints, but um, Chase is a city attorney. He's going to talk about some of the some the property discrepancies that have gone with this property or with this subdivision. So I'll turn the time over to him. Thank you, Chase. Thanks, Clint. Thank you. So one of the things we discussed in our previous meeting during the work meeting was the the staff um, process of reviewing an application once it comes in. And one of the steps that they go through when an application comes in is to review the ownership of the affected property within the application. If the applicant is not the owner of the property affected by the application, then staff requires an owner affidavit that essentially allows the applicant to um, act as an agent for the property owners. One of the things that has come up in the discussion of this subdivision is whether those affidavits exist and they do we've worked with the developer to make sure that all of the land that's affected by this um, potential subdivision is covered by an owner affidavit or alternatively is owned directly by the applicant so all right any questions maybe can we just confirm that we have one for randy mccleave we do have an owner affidavit for randy mccleave okay Thank you, thank you, Chase. And um, if, if Chase, if you need to address the question with with Randy back there, um, it, it might be. I'll, I'll allow him to make it on the record okay. um, during the meeting, during the and then you hearing, can address it after, and then I can address it. Sounds good. So during the public hearing, you can address your question, and then um, we'll talk with you after. Any other questions for me then? I don't think from this body at this point, we'll probably have some discussion afterwards where there may be some. Um, I have a question maybe for Blake. Um, can you address the, the slope for the roads? I'll have Jonathan speak okay. to that. He's been buried deep in the engineering standards for a couple of months. We so discussed he's... it a little bit, meeting, but I think it's important public information. Thank you, Heather. Before I jump in, Heather, maybe is there's sorry, sorry everybody. So, is there something specific? And I think yeah, I know can, where you're going, but can you can you just kind of briefly say what we talked about earlier with the 10 percent and where they're at with their plans? Yeah, you bet. And it's a good question. And during the work session, um, one of the commission members asked, "What is the standard maximum slope for a roadway?" And the answer to that question is 10 percent. Uh, as it sits in the standard currently today. Um, in the excuse me, in the proposed plans by the developer, it shows a 12% on the upper portion, excuse me, the southern half of the project. And it's a 12% and it starts from the very uh, beginning to the very top. Well, at least, excuse me, I take that back. 500 feet worth along there, 12%. So normally the procedure would be is any sort of a 
deviation from that standard, we would take that proposal and review that as staff and take a look to see first, the question is one, is there a compelling reason uh, that means that, that this standard cannot be achieved? Is it technically infeasible or is it just an unrealistic expectation, right? And so that's a form that we receive and take. And then what we do is we require sign off from both the public works director as well as city engineer before that can be awarded. So substantial evidence has to be provided. And again, just to iterate that, normally would take case during take place, excuse me, during the engineering phase review. Um, and so that, and, and, and knowing and hearing what some of the commission was discussing, there is a concern and I can appreciate the concern that maybe that's something that we want to discuss at this point. And so maybe it's helpful. I understand the implications on either direction. So if the staff or the commission says hold to that standard of 10% for that 500 feet that they show 12%. And if it moved down to 10, there would be 10 feet difference vertically that would perpetuate through the development, if that makes sense. Now, if we said, you know, if we looked at it and looking at everything at the engineering phase and decided 12% is what's allowable in this particular case and looking at everything Right now, the grade actually follows uh, the existing topography pretty closely, and you're going to have some cut at the top because they then taper off to almost flat. So you have a swing from following that existing grade at the top. I'm not saying there wouldn't be retaining walls, right? Because once a home gets put at the top, they would have to cut into that hillside. But if we pull them down to that 10% during that, that length, then 10 feet would perpetuate and have to be added to those retaining walls at the top. I hit on a lot and I'm certain there's more questions. I'd be happy to take any more. So you're saying that 10% could be done. Say that again. So you're saying 10% could be done with adding the 10 feet of retaining. Yes, it would require 10 feet of additional uh, cut. Now, whether a retaining wall is needed 100% at this point is unknown, okay. but likely. Thank you, Jonathan. You bet. All right, uh, at this point, um, if the applicant's present, um, they can come up and share any additional information. And just state your name as well. Yeah, James Horsley, Riverside Development. Planning Commission, appreciate your time tonight. Um, as you guys know, we came in front of you about four months ago uh, in presenting this project. And one of the reasons why we wanted to come in front of you is to get some feedback from you guys. We obviously understood that this project has a lot of attention uh, with it and stuff. So uh, with that feedback, uh, as you guys know, a lot of the discussion has been about the cul-de-sac uh, coming off uh, Solomon Way there and stuff. And uh, uh, as you guys can see, the plat that we have presented has that cul-de-sac in there. We don't have any plans from changing that. We plan on keeping that cul-de-sac uh, that way and stuff. And I know Adam had a, a lot of the comments uh, in that meeting four months ago, uh, you know, about this and how we wanted it laid out. So we felt like we did a good job in coming back with a plan that really was what you guys asked us to do uh, with that. Um, again, I appreciate uh, staff on this. Staff's been great in working with us to make sure we can accommodate everything that has been discussed and, and implemented into this, this project here. Um, to go over a couple of these uh, th these things that uh, are actually on the screen right now. Um, so first of all, uh, just uh, we talked about the cul-de-sac, um, the building envelopes. We'll obviously make sure those building envelopes th th they work on there. We'll have it on the on the plat. It'll show the building envelopes. It actually shows it on on here right now uh, where the building envelopes are, and we'll make sure we can uh, accommodate those. Um, as you guys heard, we are going to have some issues with the uh, part of the reason we were asking for the half acre lot density. Um, for that area up there was because of this 85 foot to 100 foot frontage and stuff. Um, the lots didn't change. We still had three one way or the other and stuff like that. Um, you, know, you guys and city council, you know, decided to go with the acre lot zoning, which is which is fine and we're okay with that. Uh, we will be submitting for a variance on that, and uh, we feel like we have a pretty good case because of the the hillside because we we could push it back the cul-de-sac and be able to accommodate that, that 100 foot frontage on those three lots, but. You know, with the hillside there and stuff like that, not being able to do stuff on the hillside. Uh, so we'll, we'll go through that uh, that application and, and go and get that variance uh, for those there on that. Um, 
with the uh, with the lot uh, that has the uh, uh, driveway on the side of it. So I've met with the I met with them a couple of times um, and, and discussing what what they would want there and stuff. And I feel like and they can get up there and public comment too, and they can address it too and make sure that we're on the same page there. But I feel like we've met several times. We have a good plan of what they want and, and what would be a, a good addition to to the subdivision. Uh, there um, and then, uh, of course, uh, you know the tree plan. We'll get the tree plan with, uh, with everything uh, that we have there, and then the access uh, for lot 17. Uh, lot 17 is Val Johnson's, and uh, we've obviously talked a lot, so uh, we'll make sure we accommodate everything to make sure Val has proper access to his to his house and everything uh, with that there. Um, uh, besides that, um, I think uh, that's pretty much everything. Again, I appreciate your guys' advice. Uh, and like I said, four months ago and kind of give us some direction uh, to make sure that we can get this thing to where it's satisfactory for everybody. Um, appreciate the staff and everything that they've done with that. Um, I would appreciate maybe if after public comment, if there's concerns or questions, I would love to be able to get up and address. Uh, some um, we'll, we'll actually talk as a commission uh, during that portion. Um, now's really the time to talk about anything as a, as a developer you want to address. Um, I still think there's going to be some further conversations on this, and so we'll see what we can do from there. Um, at this point, uh, I won't ask you to come back up um, unless there's something that's a direct um, question from us. And so, yeah, perfect. Yeah, and then of course, I mean, just on the uh, the ten percent slopes and stuff like that. I mean, as you guys know, you have that variance in there on hillside areas that you allow up to the 12% slope on that, that we'll work with the engineering to make sure that we accommodate anywhere we can to make sure those slopes uh, are the best that we you know, can have out there. We talked about maybe some different aggregate in the in the asphalt to, to provide grip uh, for, the, for those areas as well too, uh, which would be uh, something that we could do as well and stuff. So I think that's all the comments that uh, you guys had and I appreciate uh, your guys' time tonight. Thank you so much, James. Thank you. So at this point, we will open the public hearing. And just as a reminder, when you finish talking to this body, and it, it really will be just comments to us, um, it's not a Q&A um, at this point. Um, after everyone's had a chance to uh, address their comments to us, um, we will have a discussion as this body. And you'll see during that time that a lot of what you talked about will be addressed. Um, and so uh, at this point, we'll open the public hearing. And then if you just come up, just make sure you wipe it down afterwards. And then you'll have three minutes as an individual. If you're representing a group, you can have up to five. I'm representing more than just myself here. All right. So, um, I'm Cody Corral. I live on Solemn Way, just the street just uh, just below this. And so um, we've talked before. I've been in front of this body a couple of times. And so, and it's been really great to kind of hear the insight and hear the thought that goes into these projects. So um, I think starting off, I, overall, we really like this layout. It's kind of the one that we envisioned. And we hope for at the very beginning when we learn about this development. And so, um, again, that layout, we, we really like it. We're hoping that this can get moving forward in a, in a timely manner. We really want a lot of these families that are waiting to get in to get in. Um, we're ready for them to be our neighbors and ready to start um, meeting them and mingling them and incorporating them to what we, what we do. Um, as far as the frontage road, if I can kind of go back to this slide, too, about the density points, is that possible that I could look at those no just just uh, at this point okay. it's just comments made in regards okay. to everything perfect so the 85 foot frontage that's being asked for on the that upper cul-de-sac i don't feel like anybody feels strongly against that um again i don't know how it's gonna be how it would be work without doing those 85 foot frontage lots um unless it, it's unless it provides a safety hazard or anything like that so Drainage, I do want to talk about the drainage. So I'm, I'm very, when we first came to this body, our concerns were safety and drainage. Those were our main concerns. And I feel like the safety concern has been met. I feel like this layout provides that safety that we've been asking for um, as long as those slopes work out on the upper cul-de-sac. The drainage, we do have some concerns with. We do want to know, like, do these meet the city standard? Do they meet the city requirement? We really don't feel like the drainage should be skimped on. Um, and my question is to not Q&A, but something that I hope to hear discussed afterwards, is it appropriate to put a drainage on somebody's property, particularly in the upper two, on the upper cul-de-sac, that drainage seems like it's part of their property. Who, who is liable to make sure that drainage is clear? If that person goes on vacation, are they then liable because it's on their property? Um, is the city in charge of managing that? So that's something I would really like to hear because um, I don't think that's fair to those homeowners to have to assume that responsibility. 
um, for something that is in theirs and that, that is on their property and that uses up their property, that uses up their frontage. And so, um, and as far as that lower drainage basin, like I said, we want to make sure that meets all the city standards. We are completely fine with that going into the street and making it so there's not further west access. Access, We are fine with that as long as the millers feel like they have adequate access to their property. Um, we want to make sure that they know that they, they, have, they feel comfortable getting in and out. And they'll, they'll talk more to that. Um, as far as the bonus density points, that's the other issue I want to come up with So, to talk about. So I really have a concern about the 0.4 being given or asked for for bonus density. So that's essentially five lots. Um, I think everybody can do the math on five lots when there's homes that are 75 to 750 to 800 plus thousand. And essentially it seems to me like we're getting $28,000 in exchange for them being allowed to build five lots. In my mind, it seems like those density points are there to encourage somebody to do bigger improvements to the city if they wanna be able to make those lots. We have no problem with them maxing out those density points. That's great, but I, we feel like they need to be earned and not just given. So the one with the road, I don't feel like that's a fair density point. Um, that drainage basin is currently being extended into a road that would otherwise be have to be um, finished. So if we're allowing that drainage basin to go on a portion of the road that's then not being paid for to finish, then why does it make sense? To, you're just essentially moving that money over to that other side of the road. So there's no money that's being lost or gained. It's basically saying like, hey, instead of finishing this part of the road, you're, you'll finish that. It, it's gonna cost the developer the same as if we didn't allow that drainage basin in the road. So that doesn't make sense to me. Um, I also, to, to add point two on to uh, finishing that drainage basin, I feel again, that I feel like, boy, for that amount of money that we're saying, hey, just give us some pocket change and, and we're gonna allow five more lots of these beautiful homes, hey, I think that's great overall, but I think there needs to be more that earns it. And so, um, and I feel like there are ways that this can be earned. I feel like, hey, if this drainage basin, we have a drainage basin on top and bottom, is there a way to make those beautiful and um, more than just grass and trees? Can we make them an outdoor amphitheater? Can we put um, you know, pick a pavilion on them? Something that is really low cost to maintain for the city, but, and, and I don't know how expensive that would be for the applicant, but it seems like it would be a fair trade-off to do that. And then, hey, you get to max out your density points with that. And so we're not against the density points, but we do want them to be earned. And so, um, and, and that's really all I want to say. And I just want to thank you guys. It's been interesting and very um, educating to see the process of these developments work and how all the thought that goes into this. And and we we have no doubt that the city is going to, that you guys are going to make the decision that you feel is best for the city and and the community. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Leslie Miller. I live in the affected property with the site access. And so I have met with Mr. Horsley. I, we've had some good conversations. There's some things that for me, I want to clarify and I'm, no, it's not Q&A, so I'm just going to ask my questions, and if it comes up, that's great. Um, really, if the plan's approved, does that will that road ever go through? It doesn't appear to by plan, and I'm completely fine with that. We were, we're supportive of that, but we the way it looks, it essentially becomes that that road becomes a driveway. So who maintains that area? Who owns that area? Who is going to take care of it. Obviously, it probably is me. <laughs> and so what what does that benefit me? And um, will it also be finished? Mr. Horsley talked about it being asphalt. That doesn't fit in with the rest of the neighborhood. I would prefer concrete, but um, those, those are the big things. But in general, I'm really happy with the conversations we've had. I'm really supportive of not just the development, but I'm excited for the new neighbors. I'm excited for the things that we can do. So those are things that I, I question. Um, but other than that, I look forward to hearing the conversation. Thank you so much. We've all gotten very good at cleaning with Lysol wipes. <laughs> <laughs> Mr.
My name is Rebecca Brinkerhoff, and I also want to tell you thank you. It's been really interesting and pretty awesome to watch how this process of body works and has functioned through all of this um, system as we've watched you over the months. Um, one of my questions or concerns are at the one of the community meetings, the developer had said that he would submit a footprint for lot number 10. And I've been very concerned about how far we're going to be cutting into that mountain. Um, and it was rezoned under the ordinance, an idea to protect any slope greater than 30%. So I just wanted to, I just was curious how that process worked when a house plan is submitted, how to prevent that cutting to go into that 30% grade so there's no retaining put there. Um, I also respect the awarding of bonus density being your decision. Along with Cody, I had the same concerns. Um, there's, as I've been following a lot of different meetings, there was a meeting held, I think it was with city council back in the fall of last year, and they talked about Shoshone Estates. Now, Shoshone Estates has been passed over on being finished many times, as we've learned, and we've kind of been living here during those many times it's been passed over. And when they originally were, let's see, it was about 14,000 that they'd gotten in the fund for, for it. And when they presented it in the fall, it was presented to be about $80,000 to finish. Now, I think numbers change. I understand that the city actually has it in their budget for right now, in their capital funds budget to be finished. I don't believe it should be something we're awarding as a bonus density when we already have it proposed and planned to be finished by our city this year. Um, one of the other concerns I had is with finishing that roadway. Originally, when Hard Rock built those homes, I don't know what the ordinance was. I don't know what the plan was. Obviously, they were allowed to not finish that portion of the roadway, but we're talking about the ordinance that's in impacted now and what's in our plans now for a reason. It says we need to have them finish roadways. Roads, existing roads must be connected when you're building a subdivision. I don't believe you should get bonus density for connecting those roads. Um, with that park on your awesome list that you guys have, he would be getting 0.1 points for providing a half acre park with a playground. This is a half acre lot that he's just grassing. So I think that there's a little bit of an unbalance of awarding him two and a half houses when, I don't know, just my, my concerns with those. But again, I want to thank you for everything you guys do and watching this process. Thank you so much. Oh, hello. I assume he's your husband when he says, Yeah, I'll down. make it easy. And I am representing a group, just so you know, but I'll try to be fast and concise sure. here. So, yeah, we, we originally. Could you just state the, your name again? Curtis Brinkerhoff. Huh? Thank you. So we, we did the rezone from 2.5 to one, then there's a variance on the size of those lots. And then we're talking about a detention adjustment so that he can put a detention pond in the middle of a street and then somehow get density credits for the opposite street. And then we're talking about a fee in lieu of to finish a pond that's already been encumbered three times. When Shoshone Estates was done, when the Solemn Way development with Hard Rock was done, and now again for a third time. I have no idea how the calculation is being done to get to 0.4 for a couple of, you know, $10,000, $20,000, $30,000. A three acre park with a splash pad gives you 0.3. This seems way off to me, I'm sorry. So in my mind, a calculation should be simple. You want a fee in lieu of, you pay the value of the property. That's 160 to $200,000. 0.1 should be $100,000. I cannot fathom how you guys can approve a proposal like this in our community. It astounds me that the recommendation was that this be approved. I'm sorry, but it does. When we have variance, 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 adaptation, adaptation, adaptation to all of these things multiple times, how many times are we gonna sacrifice our community? We have individuals here that have put deposits on homes that they thought were gonna start months ago, and this has gone on since July because he won't submit a plan that complies with the standards we have set. Why? Just submit something that complies with it. Please get these people in homes. People have put deposits on homes that he's not even legally allowed to represent because an individual here is planning to keep those properties. He just allowed his property to be put in the subdivision. But people have put a deposit on it thinking they're getting a home. That's not right. Please just submit a plan that complies and do it the right way to protect our community. Please. Will you wipe down? Sorry. Thank you. Uh, 
How's it going? Good. Um, so in my whole life, I never thought in a million years I'd be sitting up here doing this. Uh, will, you, will you state your name real quick? Yeah, my name is Brett West. Thank you. Um, I, speaking of what Mr. Brinkerhoff just said, this sounds like I'm affected. <laughs> so uh, I'm here speaking on behalf of my wife and our four kids. Um, I grew up in Utah and I moved away about 15 years ago. And um, last summer, I've always wanted to move back. Last summer, we found the subdivision and uh, put down some money, and which was exactly actually lot 18, which is one of the ones in question, and um, made some big family decisions. We sold our home, and we moved here. We put our kids in school here, started going to church here. And when we arrived in November, we had no clue about all of this drama, all of the citizen concerns, all of the stuff that was happening. Um, we were totally unaware of all of it. Um, and we didn't even know that the, the lots in question weren't purchased yet until um, about a month ago. And so, you know, you can imagine the sleepless nights when you move your family across state lines and then suddenly you might not even have a place to move them. You've been promising them something for a long time. And I've had a lot of time to process that. And Actually, what I just want to say is like, I hope we can all just move forward with the subdivision, like from people on the outside. I haven't seen people from the development that were trying to purchase a home here actually have a voice. And like there's 30 families sitting on the sidelines watching people complain about a slope for a house that really like they're never going to see. And then if you go up in the cove where my brother lives, there's houses where you guys are tearing into the mountainside and we're complaining about one house forever up the street where maybe 80, 90, 100 feet back, it gets to a 30 degree slope. So I guess all we wanna say is I really hope they can move forward. I don't know what's gonna happen with my family. I came here to say that I really wanted to like encourage the folks in question to come to a deal with the, the developer for those lots. We, we've we made, we would love to make our family legacy there and plant our roots here in Harriman. And we felt fall in love with that lot. And I know it's, it's it's not up to us at this point, but we uh, we just would like to see that happen. And if not for us, for all the other 30 families that are waiting, um, we'll figure it out if we can't. Um, um, so that's it. Thanks. Thank you. My name is Randy McLeese, and I have lot 18, 19, 20, and 21. Um, this goes back a long ways when I started working with James Horsley on this, and I've gone back and forth, and and he's been really good to talk to me about some things, but some other things have been left for me to find out by accident from somebody else. And my biggest issue with this whole thing is I think the rest of it is really good and nice. My issues and and it, if this is the final approval, approval meeting, and I'm gonna tell you, you better not approve it tonight because I have to get that 10 extra 10 foot parkway strip that's out of my land, 3,300 square feet from my property that I don't get anything out of, I don't get paid for. And I think I'm supposed to pay for landscaping that extra stuff and I'm not gonna do that. And uh, James, uh, I found out about the 10, extra 10 foot park strip by some friends who saw the plat and the thing that was coming to the commission. So just so you know, I guess we'll be talking because I'm, I'm not ready to give that up. And if that, I, I hope that doesn't blow everything up again. I don't know how, how 3,300 square feet of my land that I don't get reimbursed for should be taken away from me and my wife. And it definitely needs to be addressed. And, and if, it, if it doesn't get addressed, I guess we'll have my lawyer talk to your lawyer and, and that kind of thing. And I don't want to do that. But uh, now you know my concern. And it's not, shouldn't be, if it's a final approval, don't do it because I'll fight it. If it's an approval with, when you get to do some more negotiation about parts and things, but that 10 foot parkway strip out of my property is a big issue for me. So that's all I have to say right now. Thank you, Randy.
Uh, my name's Chance Gledhill. I own five acres directly south of this subdivision. I've sent letters into the city. I've last last meeting I said my concerns. And there's there's still still my concerns because I mean the, you've let these subdivisions come in up here and 6600 has nothing in it right now. As far as, as, far as I know, they don't, the sewer's not in 6600 West, right? I don't know. Sewer, be, sewer been installed in we'll, 6600 we'll, West. We'll potentially answer questions afterwards, really a I, comment I, section. In, anyway, um, I'm kind of sandwiched in here. I, I, I couldn't get utilities or anything to my property from the south of me with the subdivision because of slope. And now here I am sandwiched in here between this and that that one, and I have no utilities here coming in to me. Um, and my concern is, is there's such a small piece of property. Was, I got five acres and I think uh, Mr. War, Jim has five acres in front of me. Uh, I have very little access there. And so if in the future, as far as development, there's gonna be very little developers are gonna to wanna to come in and develop 6600 West all the way up through there. It will not be worth it to them. It wouldn't be worth it to me to do it if I have to bring everything up 6600 West. So that's my concern with this whole thing. Um, I think I've said everything. I could say more, but I can't, once I'm up here, I can't think too well. <laughs> But I have no problem with development. Uh, that's, that's fine. But it's just I'm kind of getting sandwiched in here with things, and no one's kind of addressed my concerns at all. So, thank you. Thank you. Will you wipe down the podium if you don't mind? This, this right here. I oh, you got it. Okay, I didn't see you. Sorry. Yeah. I'm gonna wipe down everything. All right, if there's no other public comments, um, I will say at this time, I want to address the, or talk with the Planning Commission because I'm not sure we're going to close a public hearing. And so, okay, so we have two email ones. So hold on, Adam, one second. We're going to read those first. Uh, Wendy, will you read those two? The first from Krista Koch states, good evening. My husband and I have lot one reserved in the Valhalla subdivision. We really want to be on our new home by the end of the year, but if the approval of the plat gets delayed any longer, I don't know that it will be possible. When going into the meeting tonight, I ask that you please consider the strain this is putting on the families that are anxious to get into their new homes. Please approve the preliminary plat, thank you. Second one is from Randall Isham. He states, my name is Randall Isham. I live at 14431 South, 6600 West, adjacent to the proposed Valhalla subdivision, and wish to have his comments read into the record. My property abuts the west side of the Valhalla subdivision, lots four, five, and six, and on the south side of the Valhalla subdivision, lot 21. Because of the immediate proximity of these lots of the proposed Valhalla subdivision, I am concerned about flooding and erosion control, dust control, and fencing of the subdivision. Specifically, according to the map on page 31, slope analysis of the Planning Commission packet, lots four, five, and six have slopes of 10% to 20%, and the terrain of those three lots are higher in elevation than my property, causing the potential floodwaters to flow onto my property and house. Lots 7, 8, 9, 10 are immediately further east with equal and higher percent slopes, 20% to 30% that flow onto lots 4, 5, and 6, contributing to higher water flows. On page 32 of the packet, erosion control map indicates that there appears to be an unlabeled stormwater ditch going north and parallel with the west edge of property lines of lot six, five, four, and three into a retention pond between lots 18, 19, 20, and 21 
and or flowing into the retention pond on the north side of lots 18, 19, and 20. My concern that there appears to be no berm against the stormwater, stormwater ditch to contain any floodwaters and whether it is sized for at least a 10 year storm as required in the Harriman city ordinances. Please have this concern addressed in the subdivision erosion control plan. Referring back to pages 31 slope analysis and 32 erosion control plan, the rough finished grade of the subdivision is not displayed so as to make a prudent review of the potential water flows from these lots with steep slopes. Living adjacent to the subdivision, grading the slopes to flatten the steep contours to place a road and houses for these upper lots will subject our property as well as six other neighboring properties to construction dust. Please include in the stipulations of the subdivision approval a reasonable dust control plan that includes frequent use every half hour water truck watering at the grading locations. Lastly, the proposed subdivision borders on over 1300 feet on the east and north sides of my property, and I am concerned that the proposed subdivision will provide proper fencing of the property lines as per Harriman City Ordinance 10-21-7A. Please include the fencing requirements in the approval stipulations. Four, five, and six contributing to higher water flows on page 32 of the packet erosion control map indicates that there appears to be an unlabeled stormwater ditch going north and parallel with the west edge of property lines of lots six, five, four, and three into a retention pond between lots 18, 19, 20, and 21 and or flowing into the retention pond on the north side of lots 18, 19, and 20. My concern that there appears to be no berm against the stormwater ditch to contain any floodwaters waters and whether it is sized for at least a 10 year storm as required in the Harriman city ordinances. Please have this concern addressed in the subdivision erosion control plan. Referring back to pages 31 slope analysis and 32 erosion control plan, the rough finished grade of the subdivision is not displayed so as to make a prudent review of the potential water flows from these lots with steep slopes. Living adjacent to the subdivision, grading the slopes to flatten the steep contours to place a road and houses for these upper lots will subject our property as well as six other neighboring properties to construction dust. Please include in the stipulations of the subdivision approval, reasonable dust control plan that includes frequent use every half hour water truck watering at the grading locations. Lastly, the proposed subdivision borders over 1300 feet on the east and north sides of my property. And I am concerned that the proposed subdivision will provide proper fencing of the property lines as Harriman City Ordinance 1021-7A. Please include the fencing requirements in the approval stipulations. And that is it. Thank you, Wendy. Oh, wait. It I'm wondering if it would be beneficial to have the other three that we were sent, but into record maybe, because there was those, one that was really applicable to some. There were some emails that were yeah. received, so those should be read. Those, so in order to have a comment read into the record, it needs to be submitted as identified on the um, public notice for the hearing on the agenda, which does require that it be emailed to the recorder or that the form be filled out that's provided on the city's website. I think they were sent to Wendy because she sent them to us. Wendy right? said she did not they receive were, those. They were forwarded to me from the planning department. But but uh, we so all saw them, so they probably ought to be read just as a, don't you think? Uh, or else we, we shouldn't have seen them if that was we, all saw, we probably ought to make sure everybody understands what we saw. That would be my recommendation. It would be your call whether or not you want those read into the record. I absolutely I think you should. I, th I, I think they should as well because we have seen them. And so to put them in public record. But I think in the future we need to handle that the correct yeah. way. And so. Um, give me one moment to find those. Yeah, we'll give Wendy a second. And I did see one other individual grab a form um, if he was wanting to come up and give a public comment now. Um, and maybe I was wrong. Oh, there might be more than one. I 
name's Aaron Smith. Um, we have one of the lots in the Valhalla subdivision. Um, my main thing to Keen is that is get this moving forward. We've lived in Harriman a long time. We found this these lots that are a little bit bigger size. Harriman seems to want to go with these 0 0.1, 0 0.15 lots. And I mean, for me, that's not what I wanted. So when these lots came available, we were like, this is what we want. And then to have the delay after delay, um, I obviously don't know the logistics between the Planning Commission and Mr. Horsley, but from what it seems like Mr. Horsley's done his part as well as you guys have, you know, you've gone the back and forth. Um, I would just request that we just get this moving forward. This back and forth has put a lot of families, including my own, out. We, again, like some of the others, we went in, got everything started with uh, the Mylars, unaware of the situation going on with the city. And then we up and sold our house and we were planning on being with just in-laws for a short brief time. And now due to the nature of the extended time to get things approved as well as build times and this and that, we've had to find an apartment. So not only is it costing me more money than what we initially planned, um, it, it's also a burden on my family. And I don't think that it's fair to all of us that are waiting to move into these homes to have this be drug out any longer. I just ask that you guys come to an agreement with Mr. Horsley, whatever it may be, and hopefully get this approved tonight so we can get moving forward. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chair, just as a, a point of procedure, the commission's rules do allow for a rebuttal by the applicant at okay. the end. Um, it does allow you to alter that procedure, um, but it is explicitly listed that there may be a rebuttal by the applicant at the end of the public comment portion. Okay, thank you. Thank you for clarification on that. But just to be clear, that's at the end of the public comment, not the end of our discussions, correct? Uh, the order states that unless altered by the chair, the order of procedure at a public hearing on an application shall be the presentation by the staff, the applicant's presentation, and then group comment, um, which would be the public comment not to exceed five minutes, individual comments not to exceed three minutes, and then rebuttal by the applicant if necessary, and then discussion by the council. Thank that, you. That was a summary. It, the, it's on page five of seven if you'd like to look at the specific role. Thanks, Jay. Thanks, Chase. Oh, Wendy, were you able to find those emails? Yes. Yes. Thank you. And there's three of them, correct? We we have one from Randy McCleave, and he already spoke, but I'm happy yeah. to read that. And one from Kyle Rands and Chance Gladhill. Yeah. So, and yes. so at, at least but, two of those have spoken as right. well. Um, but but pl please do that. read it. Yeah. So from Randy McCleave, it states I am the property owner of lots 18, 19, 20, 21 in the Valhalla project. I have a question regarding the 10 foot park strip behind the sidewalk listed in the packet as a 10 foot park strip required for all property along 6600 West. I have not given anyone permission to take that property from my lots. I need to talk to someone about this ASAP. Please contact me at the number below. And here's one from Chance and Nikki Gledhill. I'm writing you in order to make my voice heard as far as the Valhalla subdivision proposed by James Horsley. My wife and I own five acres directly south of this proposed subdivision. Our concern is that we are getting landlocked as far as utilities to our property. We were told by the city that our property could not be part of the subdivision to the south of us because of the slope. And when development happened in the north of us, we, we would be able to get utilities that way. The proposed plat is cutting us out again. We are getting sandwiched in. Would you please look at requiring some sort of easement from the developer, Mr. Horsley, for utilities for our property? 
There is no way for development with Mr. Ward to my west. It would be way too costly to bring everything up 6600 west for such a small subdivision. Being landlocked with utilities and access will obviously devalue our property. Please make these notes known to the Planning Commission and anyone else in authority to make the best decision for all involved. And then this one is from Kyle Rands. It says, I'm reaching out in regard to the notice about the Valhalla subdivision scheduled for public hearing on 3-4-2021. I'm concerned that the new plan revised from what was previously submitted on 9-4-20 now has Solomon Way ending in a cul-de-sac rather than continuing up the hill and connecting into Valhalla Circle. And it oddly enough now has the east end connection on Valhalla dead ending into residential properties. By, co by closing off that additional access road, it now forces all Valhalla residents to enter slash exit via 6600 West. 6600 West is notorious for speeders with speeds typically observed at 35 to 40 miles per hour with the occasional high-speed race in excess of 50 miles per hour. The current topology and obstructions at the intersection of Valhalla and 6600 West create natural blind spots that will have residents entering that street with cars traveling at extreme speeds downhill and increasing the risk for severe automotive accidents. I've personally observed numerous times now close call accidents at that intersection. With the plan presented on 9-4, it allowed for a second access point on the less busy Solomon Way Road. It additionally provided clear and continuous sidewalk access for the kids and other residents living on Valhalla and removed the risk of kids having to travel along 6600 West. I'd appreciate additional information around why this access point was removed oddly redesigned and now increasing safety risks for the residents and children residing on Valhalla. Just a little perplexed how this was perceived as a good idea. Thank you for your time and attention on this matter, Kyle Rands. Thank you, Wendy. And um, the only question I have for the Planning Commission before we turn a couple minutes over to the developer or the applicant again is, um, do we want to keep this public hearing open? Yes, I just was emailed another comment. Would you like me to read yeah. it? I think there was someone else in the audience that wanted to speak to you. Okay. Just, yeah. This is from Casey Holly. It says, I have tried like crazy to get a public comment to you. There is no way to find out how to get a comment added to the public hearing. Here's what I have to say. I have been a citizen of Harriman for the last 15 years. I was excited to be able to find a decent sized piece of land last year with a builder that would offer a great place and price for my family to build. With prices skyrocketing and the land in Harriman getting swallowed up more and more every day, dreams and wants of building my own home in the community I love seem distant. Gordon Mylar offered us a reasonable price on a great piece of land he is a very good builder to work with and has been honest on this project from the beginning. I was upset the approval for the zoning took so long as there is a home literally just south of this project built directly into the mountain. I have also watched and listened to every meeting. Mr. Horsley has amended the proposed project to meet the wants slash needs of the residents on, on Solemn Way, as well as the ideas that I believe Adam expressed early on. As we have been waiting for this project to be approved for nine months, I would ask that we get moving on this project. Also expressed in an earlier meeting from one of the residents was that Mr. Horsley should not get credits for finishing a sidewalk slash road that a previous builder neglected to finish. If a builder developer is going to fix or finish something that somebody else should have finished, they absolutely should get credit. As a future potential resident of Solemn Way, I hope that the residents can see there are good families that can bring value to this neighborhood and that the developer has made the adjustment they requested early on. 
Thank you for working hard on this and making sure everything is lined out the way it should be. But please approve this so all of us families can now move forward with respect and sincerity. Signed, Casey Holly. Thank you, Wendy. Was there anyone else in the audience that wanted to make a public comment? My name is Karen McCleave. I own the, I don't know, the, the three lots and then the bigger lot that they're, they have. Number one, our biggest shock was that all of a sudden we were told that three of our lots were sold when they were not even up for sale and nobody came to us to buy our lots. They were sold by somebody, I don't know who. And number two, to a couple of days ago to find out that 10 feet of our entire property is being donated, never asking us anything. And that's that's not okay with us. We're not going to do that. Um, and just like say that we will pull our, our two and a half acres out of this. So if you're gonna approve it, you'll have to approve it without our two and a half acres if that's the case. Cause Things are just being stolen from us, and that's that's not right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, now, just the one question to the Planning Commission: Do we uh, view that we need to leave this public hearing open? Yes. To for a future date. Yes. I'm seeing. Pretty much numerous head nods. So I got two head nods, yes, and one yes I, over here. I'm going to say I disagree, but it's just because I think we've met the substantial intent. We're talking about people's perceptions and beliefs. I think we've pointed out all of the concerns of the area, but I, I'm open either way. I just wanted to say. I, I think the question is um, will, is there a possibility of this changing? And if there's a possibility of this changing, then the public hearing may need to be done again. I concur with that. Okay, so uh, so we are going to leave the public hearing open for a future date, but we uh, we will ask the applicant to uh, to come up and and make additional comments if you'd like to at this time. Chair, we're not hearing any more comments today, correct? I can't see who's no, all in. No it. more comments today, so, uh, so we won't have any more today, but it, it will be left open for a future date. Well, thank you for the opportunity to get up and uh, speak about some of the comments that was made. I want to make sure that we're addressing this uh, point two and getting uh, streets done and the pond done. So as you guys know, and what you guys are requiring us to do on Valhalla Drive is we have to do, when you develop a subdivision, you have to do the half width road plus 10. So really what I would be doing in the subdivision would be like three feet of asphalt and curb and gutter on my side of the road if the developer before me did what they were supposed to do. So it's not a little piece of property that we're that we're coming in and doing. It's actually a lot of money to do what we have to do to to correct an issue that happened before. So to, to get that point density forward, we, we discussed it with staff, discussed it with you guys before. Everybody knows that it's a need that has to happen, and it's not something that I need to do. It's something something that should have been done before with it. We're willing to address it and we're willing to take care of that. With the pond, if you go back in the history of the thing, as you guys have stated in this thing, that there has been credits given to other developers to participate in this pond. We're asking for the exact same thing that has been given to other developers is what we're asking for. We're participating in a pond that we're having an impact on and making the city better by having this pond finally finally landscaped and done to beautify the city here. Um, some of the comments that were made too as well is, I wanna make sure we understand these lots are big lots here. These are not just tiny lots. We have a couple of comments we've made about smaller lots around the city and stuff like that. These are big lots here. These are gonna be great homes. They're gonna be going here and stuff. So so I, I don't get the fight of, of what we're trying to do here. Everything that we're offering to get the point density is bringing a value to the city is what it's doing. We've gone over with staff. I mean, staff has degrees in what they do here and stuff like that. You know, if somebody made a comment about they were so disappointed in the staff and recommended this. Staff works hard here. Staff works with you guys. They talk to you guys about stuff. Staff goes over and over what should happen in the city and what's the most beneficial for the city. Staff has worked, I mean, again, where here we are, what, nine months in, into this project here. Things get said when we have DRC meetings and stuff like that. 
that's when we start talking about slopes. That's when we start talking about lot sizes. That's when we start talking about all this stuff. All this stuff was addressed nine months ago when we had our DRC meetings and, and what the city can and can't do. So everything that, that we are presenting to you guys is stuff that we have been told is okay in the city. This is not stuff that the people keep on saying we're, we're presenting a plan that why don't we just submit something that, that should be approved? Well, it should be. You have staff recommendations saying that it should be approved. We've been over backwards to make sure that we get what you guys want. We've addressed the safety concerns. And as you can see, you're not gonna please everybody. Now you have somebody saying, why are we, why are we not taking that road through? So what resident are we gonna make happy? Are we gonna make these residents happy? We're we gonna make that resident happy. Because that resident's not happy and they have a, a, a legitimate gripe. And now we're sending kids out to 6600 West that we have no sidewalks on. We're making all these kids go out that way now on a 45, on a, a road that people are going 40 miles an hour. So you're not gonna make everybody happy. We're doing our best to make sure it's the best thing for the city. We've tried very hard on this thing. I apologize for any of the people that have bought lots or put money down on lots. As you know, that has nothing to do with me. This has been talked in city council and stuff like that. There is a builder that is buying these lots. I think the builder has been pretty open and honest with these guys in what's happened. They, they, they're not, there's not guaranteed a lot. There's, it's, it's refundable money, which is legal to do but that everybody just wants to move forward. But the crisis that we're having in our city, in our, in our state, with, with, with the, the lot shortage, we need to move forward. This is a project that, that, that meets the standards of what the city has asked us to do. There's no reason to be able to, and it sounds like we're gonna table this thing because we're, we're leaving public comment open again, which we'll be, we'll be going on in what, our third or fourth meeting with public comment now? I guess I don't see what other, other comments are gonna be made. The comments are here. We need to work through staff. We need to work through planning commission and figure out what's gonna be the best scenario and get this thing moving forward is all I ask. If you have, this is why we came to you guys before. We loved you, Adam gave the comments. We, the plat that we are showing is exactly what you guys asked us to do. And now we're getting more feedback and more fight over it. I'd appreciate just knowing what we need to do and, and, and getting it done so that we can move forward for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Do you. I'm gonna unmute, you ready? <laughs> All right, Adam. Um, so I'll turn it to you in one second, but I wanted to state just one thing before that. Um, so as we went through this, um, there's, there's definitely some areas that don't comply with our city standard. And I wanna make that very clear because there's a city standard of requirements placed upon this. And, and a real simple one is there's a, there's a lot that doesn't have 85 foot frontage. And, and so when they bring it to us, we look for it to be complete so we can approve it. Because if we approve something that's not complete, what happens is you don't get what's required by our city sometimes. And so there tends to be problems if we don't approve a finished product. And so um, I'll, I'm going to let Adam go into a couple items. I have a, a, a list of about eight of them, but I'll let Adam because uh, I did want him to address some of the, the allowed um, density and because he did talk about that in our prior meeting. And then we'll also open it up to the whole planning commission on discussion. So, so um, if the staff would open up the slides that they were presenting earlier, I'd like to use those as some of the discussion of some of my ideas that as, as, I, as staff presented their points. Um, I agree with Mr. Horsley. I think we were pretty clear on the layout and I have no intention of changing the layout. I think we're gonna talk about lot density and I remember at the time actually saying, I don't concur with the lot density. Uh, and that'll be another discussion we can talk about when we get there. And so now we're there. So what I'm gonna say, is starting at this map, and I think this is a perfect discussion. Um, I would, I'm going to actually go ask the staff to go look, but I would argue that the subdivision with the, uh, if someone could take their mouse, whoever's driving, and go over to the very north, uh, the northern extension where the lot um, that has the access uh, is, uh, the access challenge is where we didn't expand it with Shoshone, uh, Shoshone Hills is what I'm going to talk about there at the very top of this paper. Um, 
the city should have collected a fee in lieu of that road extension. And I think the city needs to go in and, and resolve that issue. And then the developer is responsible for building the road all the way to the extension to the area. That is a requirement and in my interpretation of our ordinance. It's been in our ordinance for every subdivision. And if you go look at every subdivision, I agree with Mr. Horsley that it should be to the extent plus uh, 10 feet beyond that or whatever the city staff is requiring, but the city should have some funds there. So to me, that whole roadway should be able to extend. So since nobody's moving the hand, I'm going to make sure that I, I want them to move it. So people in the public, since we have people virtually, I need you to show what I'm talking about here. So people understand clearly. And I want to make sure that Mr. Horsley well, I think understands. You just have control of the mouse, Clinton. So somebody needs to do it because I want to make sure that Mr. Horsley understands exactly what I'm saying. So that when it comes back, I, we're not being accused of changing anything. So I want to make sure. So I'm going to hold until somebody can move that mouse. So who asked? Oh, there we go. I there see we go. Doing. So what I'm talking about is if you move your mouse a little bit to the left, from there, oh, that roadway should be completely constructed and stubbed into the future development of that property. That should be part of our ordinance. It is part of our ordinance. And that is a requirement in every subdivision. And, and I agree with Mr. Horsley, there should be some cost there. I don't believe it's worth the 0.2 density, and I'll get to that in a minute, but that's a discussion issue that we have. The other issue I'm gonna go is now, if you take your mouse and go down to the other location where lots, um, I can't see them on this map, but if you go to where the stub- oh, there we go. We got a big mouse now. <laughs> yeah. We got a big mouse now. You have to do multiple mouses to do one. Now, nice. So if somebody could take and move the mouse again to the location where it stubs in to kind of create the flag lot is what I will call it uh, for the land up on the hill with the, the larger home that's already currently constructed. That, that's lot 17, I believe. Yeah, thank you. Lot 17, that needs to be addressed so we can adjust and ensure that that is a safe turnaround for everybody in that area. So I need engineering staff to make sure that that comes back with sound tie-ins for that lot, that land. If you look, there is a roadway that will be stubbed into a already approved subdivision that basically, if I'm, if I'm not paying attention, I can run into a fence. So that needs to be addressed before I think we mitigate anything related to the road. And then Adam, just to address a question, um, because these are city roads, they will maintain that road. The city will maintain it, and I've never seen us maintain a dead end for the rest of its life. Everywhere else we do a dead end, those typically end in a cul-de-sac or a knuckle or something. But in a temporary uh, construction, that's one thing. But this is part of the subdivision, so therefore it should be a, de a dead end that is usually done in a cul-de-sac or a knuckle. And so that might change a little bit of the road configuration, and that's why I think it's fair to leave the public comment open because it might change the design. But I think we need to address that because you are stubbing a full road into that area. I also appreciate Mr. Horsley pointing out that I think we need to evaluate what, when 6600 gets uh, tied into. I agree this is the best plan. I do agree we're not gonna solve everybody's dilemma, but I, do, I think we need to evaluate whether 6600 is, it is a capital facilities project and I'd like the city staff to look into that and evaluate whether that needs to be resolved now where they are able to get reimbursable impact fees to resolve 6600, but that's up to the city staff and requiring that. But I do wanna hear from staff at the next time we have this meeting on what they're trying to address in that area for transportation. Now I'm gonna to shift to storm drain detention and retention. I have never seen us store temporary city-owned storm drain, because this will turn into city-owned storm drain. I would ne I've never seen us put that on private land. So I would like to have the city staff address why we're allowing that. That's just a generic overall, I'd like to hear it. Um, and I'm okay if you wanna tell me now, or if you wanna adjust it later when you actually have reviewed it. It sounds like after reviewing through staff's recommendations, that was a major concern. If I go to their uh, number, their answer is um, in number three, it says the applicant to comply with all city engineering standards for detention, which may affect the overall number of the lots possible for this development. So I wanna be clear, I do not wanna talk about it until we've evaluated that the storm drain pond can be on this land or where it will be so that we can see what the lot count reduction will be. 
I don't see it. Adam, the other item with that is it was clearly stated by staff. They're unsure if the retention ponds need to be bigger. Correct. And so what I'm saying that is was they not should, answered at this point. They should do that. And that's normally part of the preliminary plat. And I have gotten a lot more uh, uh, detailed, but if you go look at our preliminary plat ordinance, it actually shows that we should see contours, maps, and all kinds of stuff that is not on this drawing that we're seeing. So we need to make sure we're complying with our true ordinance and requirements there. Which will answer a lot of the drainage issues. Correct. But questions I, that have been talked about. And I'd like city staff to address the fact that we've never done two small ponds for a small subdivision. Typically, we try and regionalize those. So I don't see the benefit in that for the city uh, long term. So we need to make sure we're, we're addressing storm drain as a whole, as identified by city staff. So now if we go to the next slide, and I think I've kind of talked about roadway and I've just talked about storm drainage because those are my two big issues. And now I'm going to talk about density. And that's my last one. I think I've addressed the access issue from my concern. And again, this is just me. It's just Adam. And there's other voices. I'm just trying to articulate because I'm also kind of grumpy when it comes to this. We have never done a density bonus of double point twos. So I want to point that out that we've never done that. It is for you do a project. Now I could argue, you could argue what level that is. We've never really defined that. But what I would say is what's being outlined in here the roadway construction in the 14300 South should be part of that developer's requirement period, no matter what. I know that there probably was a fee in lieu of, and if there wasn't, then the city needs to come up with their own figure because that was their bad for the uh, access that you're seeing to the home that comes off of that little dirt lane right there. That is the responsibility of the developer to extend that property right there. I've already talked about that. That's not part of a density bonus, so it shouldn't be an extension. Now, if you were doing larger things like 6600 West and things like that, that's where we've talked about that that's where a density bonus would be applicable, but you would never be able to add double densities for doing city-wide dedication of and installing of system improvements. So the other thing is I thought they were 0.15. I've never seen that we counted as two, if I remember, in our discussion. So we need to make sure that they're, they're accurate and then we equate that as appropriate. And maybe I'm standing corrected if I'm wrong, but I thought it was 0.15. So, um, and again, I would also agree with some of the discussion of if we've already collected fee in lieu of for landscape of a detention pond already, that's why we required that. We, we required a bond in Shoshone. Obviously, econ ec the economics controlled whatever it is. I don't agree with the whole dollar assessment because that's not our plan. A planning commission, unfortunately, cannot talk about dollar assessments whatsoever. But usually it's betterments of the community. So that's beyond grass and sod. Typically that's grass, sod, playground. We've done, uh, we've done splash parks. We've done uh, parking lotted uh, subdivision uh, ponds and parks for like regional soccer areas and things like that. That's typically what would qualify for a 0.2 density. So I'm going to leave that on. Maybe that's a possibility, but I don't think you get a double. That's my opinion. And I think I've classified all of my major concerns with this development. Um, and like I said, I really do care about the flag lot extension for uh, review with city staff. We need to ensure that we are doing this for the end result. That land. That future home, that that current homeowner will not be allowed to develop any further. We need to ensure it's done in a finite, completed way before I am comfortable making any motion, no matter whatever frustrations I'm sure you, there are on both sides of the count side. That's my what I would say, Chris. Thank you, Adam. And and just going along with that, and you addressed some of them, the road, roadway connectivity, you talked about it, um, the access to lot 17 and how that would be, to me, is incomplete. And so it needs to come back to us complete how that's going to look. Um, the, the ability for uh, just lot 20 uh, to meet the 85 foot, it's not a very hard change, but we like to see what the finished product is so that doesn't come back as a different product. And so just uh, the 85 foot versus the 82.2, so it meets our standard. Um, and then also the slope, um, we'd like to see a little more detail on that, why with the variance and, and what it'll look like, what it entails. 
um, because that is not something we typically do. Um, we typically don't go from 10 to 12 percent. And so, um, Chris, I agree with what you're saying. Maybe we should have a maybe you should have a, a visual of what the benefit of going to a 12 versus a 10 would be. You know, I, I agree because I th I think seeing that. Because he can do it as a 10 foot, but you see this this large step up and it's going to look very different than a 12, 12 foot slope. And so there's definitely some reasons we'd like to see what it is um, and, and the reason why behind it. The, the other thing that that um, we addressed at the early part of this is in the cul-de-sac, it's actually required to have, and Clint, um, on the cul-de-sac, it's required to have 100 foot in that zone. Is that correct? On the, on the frontage part of it? Frontage. And so right now, none of them are meeting that. And so um, typically we don't allow the variances because what happens is then all of a sudden we allow one variance here. And if there's a good reason to, then sometimes it occurs that we can, we can actually find a reasonable solution of why we need this. But if not, then all of a sudden we have 25 different developers saying, you allowed it once, you allow it now. And so precedence is something very important for the city to protect itself and to pre protect zones. And so we need to be very careful on why that would be allowed if that's going to be allowed. And so right now there's not um, enough that's been brought to us on why it has to be allowed. And so, and then the, it sounds like, and I just want to give Chase a chance because it sounds like there were some uh, uh, I guess legal questions brought up in this meeting and I just want to give him another second to be able to talk because um, a lot of what was addressed in the public comment was looking at the city um, and I just want him to address maybe the process of what happens not so much each individual item but just address what a typical process is when we see these developments and builders and everything else because I've never heard this uh, happen before, and I've been on here for seven years. And so uh, maybe just take one minute because I'd, I don't want to talk anything legal. <laughs> well, I, I think it would be better actually to speak in spe specific rather than generalities because we are discussing a specific. And, and that is fine. You're the legal counsel for the city. So that being said, is there a specific legal item you would like me to address? Um, I, I noticed with some of the instances where they were talking about um, park strips and ownership and different things like that, they, they looked straight at us and said, I will not allow that. Um, and, and maybe to, to define why that was even on there then. Um, and then the other, the other uh, concern, which a lot of people concern, uh, were concerned with, is I own this land, but it hasn't been approved yet. And just concerned what uh, sort of talk about what the process is there, because I've never seen before a plot is recorded ever, um, at least in this meeting, when someone comes in saying that that's my lot. And so maybe just address sort of that those two parts of it and if the planning commission has anything else that they'd like you to address um just some clarity from the city perspective on this well, chase i think it's because of the whole when you combine it they're getting a den density bonus so I, I don't understand why i agree with chris I, I don't see why we would be having the developers internal workings of how they've negotiated this land i'm confused why we're getting that where typically that's an internal of their development so I'll address both of those items from, from uh, Chris and Adam. So the, the process, like I described earlier, is that if the applicant is not the owner of the land that's being affected, the city requires an owner affidavit that essentially creates a principal agent relationship that allows the applicant to speak on behalf of, of the landowner. We have that in the case of Randy McCleave. We have a signed affidavit from Randy McCleave that authorizes James Horsley to represent him in this application. Um, I'm not, you obviously heard what Randy had to say um, and his, his family about that relationship that there may be an understanding. I would recommend that that's between James Horsley and the McLeaves to resolve. Um, like I said, from the city's perspective, we have an affidavit that allows James to act in that behalf, in that manner and on their behalf. If the McLeaves choose to change that relationship, they would need to inform us in writing of a change in that relationship. But for today's purposes, that affidavit exists. 
that doesn't necessarily negate what they have said here, and that's for the commission to determine in making a motion or further discussing this item. Um, as for, and I'm sorry, what was the second item? I had it written down and now I don't see it on my notes well, sure, that you okay. wanted to bring up. Um, Adam, did you want to restate it? You stated it a little bit better than I did, I think. I, I think what he just said result, I mean, I've just never seen it, but if we have his affidavit, I think it really is internal to them. So I, okay. But, but then the second part I think is in regards to, um, in this meeting before the plots are recorded we've never had to address different ownership of the individual plots because they don't exist yet and, and Chris, I, would, I would say pre-sales what what's the issue with pre-sales yeah i think that's more the focus but i, I don't maybe think address that part because we've never had in this meeting while well, i've been here something like this occur so what mr horsey represented is a correct statement of the law it is legal for a landowner to take deposits on on proposed plots as long as there is no exchange in ownership of that land um, as you can see on the county's records there is no change in title on this property it is still all owned by mr horsley or by um, the mccleaves and i believe val johnson owns some of those other properties down at the bottom um, east corner so as far as taking deposits that is a legal transaction that can occur as long as again those those funds are reimbursable and there is no exchange in the title of the property but that okay. should not push us to have pressure to move this along that's yeah. an internal agreement between them correct chase that is that that's a private transaction it doesn't involve the city um yeah it, it's simply a, a private transaction that, so uh, i mean what, one of my concerns um that was brought up with lots 18 through 21 where part of our our bonus our density bonus involves those lots right and so if they were to change and not be included in this this changes the whole density bonus lot numbers all those things so for me those items need to be addressed before it comes back to us next time all right. Um, uh, additional comments from the Planning Commission. So um, in our work meeting, um, we were talking about the density bonuses. And I have to agree with Adam where I don't think that they meet the density bonuses. But one of the other ones that he didn't mention was I don't I don't know how I feel about the 10 foot park strip along the collector street. And here's why. Um, if you drive up 66, you'll see that there's so, like nobody takes care of those park strips. Nobody is pulling out the weeds and it looks terrible. Um, even where we have, we're gonna require a wall um, along 66 for a couple of those lots. And I'm worried about maintenance. Um, so I, I, I don't think we should even do the 10 foot park strip right there. It hasn't been required in, in any of the other developments, um, according to Clint Wright. And I'm just kind of wondering if it's going to kind of affect the overall connectivity to 66 if we add in that additional 10 feet. So I don't know that I'm really for adding that. What are your guys' thoughts? Yeah, I mean, my, my biggest concern is with the current owner not even wanting that as well. And the, if they were to change how they want to move forward, <laughs> that it's going to change the number of lots and it affects the density bonus that is being proposed to us. Adam? I would say I'm in favor of the 10 foot. Oh, thank you, Jackson. I'm in favor of the 10 foot. I think it uh, adds to the city to have that 10 foot piece. Um, however, you know, I assume that that is, you know, part of the development. But I, I think it's worth I think it's uh, worth the density bonus, the ten foot piece. I agree with that. I, I feel like uh, uh, the ten foot tends to add a uh, more open feeling, so um, yeah. it does it does allow for the density bonus. Now, you get the so, ten feet, you get the trees. It really makes a big difference in the feel of the neighborhood. The, the other thing, the other thing I was going to add is I agree with what Jackson's saying in that. The 10 feet and Blake pointed it out in the 
pre-meeting, but he didn't put it out. So I'm going to share that the construction of 66 says when the city does actually do that will be difficult because of the amount of grade there. There will be a lot of cut and fill. And so I think that setback will help adjust that as it goes on. Give the city some flexibility there. So I'm okay with that piece of the density. Um, but I'm, like I said, I, I can see your point, Heather. Power out? <laughs> Someone kick something. Oh, power's on. Okay, it just kicked out for a second. Um, and then one one other thing that I want to get um, the the view from the planning commission on is the connectivity. We talked about the road, but we also had another landowner um, adjacent to this property, and I know that. We often look at all the landowners in the development and around the development to make sure that it further provides connectivity. Um, what are some of the views on on that item that was brought up in the public hearing what, portion? What landowner was, can somebody tell me, maybe see staff point out, go to the sure. map that shows uh, like the overall and show what land are we, what person? Can, can we look at an overall map of this? And then we'll have, uh, yeah. If we have to have him come up, we'll we'll have him point out um, his actual land that he owns adjacent to it. Adam, I want to say that in a past meeting, you've you asked Mr. Horsley to work with him to see if they could figure something out with the utilities. And that's what I remember as well that that was brought up because we don't want to landlock any developer or any um, landowner um, in adjacent. There was two. There was one that was uphill from it, which is all on the thirty percent slope, which I don't know that we can do anything about. Okay. And then there was the other one that I think extending the util the roadway towards. If I, if I, let's if let's I just look it. at that. Oh, okay, there we go. There, um, that's probably as close as we're going to get. I don't think we have an aerial that shows more than that. Um, and it, no, there's, the, there's that the one, green that one, that one works. So, yeah, so yeah, the, chance, the one might just pointing out the property in, in reference here. I can speak to that pretty clearly. Oh, too. you can? Okay, we'll let Blake do it as well. So, it's the five acres directly south of the A1 zone that is part of this development. Okay. So, it's in between the two A1 zones, correct? Yeah, yeah. his this so property is currently ones. zoned FR 2.5. The chances property is and the we've looked into access for this from this development and we've talked about the 10 percent road grade and as we if we hold to that 10 percent or even 12 percent you're still coming in so low that you'll be you know 10 to 20 feet below the property existing grade when you come in so you'll be leaving a low grade so so roadway access is a concern here because then we're we're just leaving a basically a hole for utility access. We viewed that as um, the property owner needs to coordinate with the the developer on this project to if there's a sewer or water line or something like that that needs to run through. Um, but Blake, how would they access this in any way? I mean, even if it's one home, they could put one home on here, right? With the zone it is possibly. How, how would they access that without an easement? How, how are we accommodating that? So it was mentioned that there's um, five acre parcels to the west of this. I, I'm aware that there's an, a 20 foot easement, which doesn't provide the required access to this property across one of the five acre pieces that's, that is west of the, the Gled Hill property. So as we looked at that, we've looked at the grades, that road would run at about 8% um, following natural grades to access that property. Um, it's about a 50 foot drop over 600 feet. Um, the issue with the access though is in our ordinance, we don't allow for private roads unless you have a PUD, which requires 15 acres, which there's not 15 acres that Chance could coordinate with to make a PUD. And <clears throat> so we don't allow private roads and it would exceed our flag lot ordinance because it would be too far, too long of a road. So there would be some requirement for the city to be flexible to allow something or or we'd require a 53 foot wide <clears throat> public road from 6600 west back to this parcel um, that would be a, a large burden for a lot that only has or a piece of property that would only allow two lots the way it's currently zoned and it is adam mentioned um, highly encumbered by 30 percent slope 
So that was another concern is if the road went up into this, the cutback slopes would cut into this 30% slope as it came up and it would pretty much render the, the Val Johnson piece, this A1 zone undevelopable. They'd, they'd get one lot out of it and it would make the road overtake so the whole lot. But for future, when this comes back, I do think we need to have all that on record of why we're, why we aren't requiring a road over there is what I'm trying to say. Okay. We can certainly make an exhibit that, um, does a better job than me explaining it by words. Yeah. And, and just, a, just an item that addresses that in the future that's documented because we do, we want to give landowners access if we can. And so, all right. Um, Jackson. I was going to say there's a decent map in our packet that kind of shows that lot on page on 25 in our packet. I don't know if that can be shown, but what was the what was the landowner's name? Just so I can write that uh, down. Glenn Hill. It's yeah, Chance Glenn Hill. I think that one's a little tricky because it's you know outside of the subdivision, but I'd love, like you said, get the opinion of staff of what their recommendation is, how to how to best address that for that resident. Um, if it's an easement through this subdivision or like you said, some other means of getting utilities to that that plot. Yeah. I have another question. So for lot number twenty one, um why wouldn't we require a road to access that property in front of it? So just because it, can it have a driveway go out to 6,600? Are we talking about um, the lot that's not in the red lines? Lot 21. Where's lot 21? Lot 21. Just so I can remember. Lot 21 is the big one of the two and a half acres right below okay. below. So 19, 18, and 20, which had your 85 foot concern. Oh, okay. So it's directly below it. Okay, got it. And Heather, what was the question again? I was wondering why we wouldn't require a road there. Down 6,000? Um, just right. The, I mean, the only access or 6, is from 6,600. Well, staff said that you can access it from 66. We don't have a standard ordinance that uh, that um, does not allow a driveway on to 6600 West. We we try to work to reduce the number of driveways, and this this plan reduced them, so it achieved our goal of reducing driveways onto a collector road. But it's still a minor collector, so it, I mean, it, 66. If you go over into Hamilton Farms, just this it extends all the way over to there called blade drive and it has every home off of it right so i mean it, this is meets that intent okay I'm trying to think uh i have some comments after go ahead heather okay so for for me what's important for me to see is that the 10 percent on the the roads are met I want to make sure that we're keeping that 10 percent i don't i know that we've talked about it with engineering but i think that safety is so important especially when we're coming up with these hills and we're going to have lots of kids um so i want to make sure that we're within that 10 percent which is our ordinance and then um Another thing that was that was brought up that's really important to me too is that we're not building into the mountain and going beyond that 30% slope. Um, so I just want to make sure that that's clear. But I also wasn't clear because in our packet, if you look under our ordinances on page 24, it talks about um, the lot grades and it's saying grade from prop property line, the grade of a slope from a property line shall not exceed 25%, except as permitted by a variance approved under section 10.5.21 of this title. So I was thinking that it was 30%, but is it 25%? So we've been working through lot grades a lot lately because it the code contradicts itself with building code and with engineering standards. Um, what we've 
what we've typically done is let the engineering standards drive, which allow a three to one slope maximum. And then if they exceed that, they have to build a retaining wall um, to, to accomplish that slope. It's mainly a maintenance and safety issue. And, and so once you get steeper than three to one, it's, it's difficult to maintain. And, uh, and then there's tripping hazards and stuff. So um, retaining walls become necessary at that point. That, I had a question for Blake. Uh, have they submitted a grading plan with this? Or do they just have the overlay of the existing grading? Uh, yeah, there's a grading plan. I believe it was included in your packet, um, page 32. Okay. Um, I don't know if that does it justice. That might, I think that has proposed an exist, some existing grades on it. It looks like it's just the existing grades it doesn't appear to show road topography or any of those elements with it. Um, I'll have Jonathan speak to that because I think there was a grading plan that we did look at. And I don't know what sheet it would be in the packet to be honest, but I'm I'm staring at the plan set right now. It appears it's got both the existing topography as well as the proposed. Okay. Um, and for reference, it's sheet C2.10. In the plan set. In the plan set. The plan set wasn't included in the packet, okay. just select pages were. So when we went through the DRC process, they submitted plans that met the criteria in the in this in the code for minimum minimum submittal requirements for engineering and okay. planning to review. And they included I, I want to stand corrected. They did include those in our packet. So thank you. I was wrong in making that assumption that it wasn't included. Okay. All right. Um, any other questions for Jonathan while he's standing up? <laughs> yeah, there were quite a bit that came out. I'd, I'd, I'd be happy to speak to anything that you'd like. I mean, yeah, one of the concerns I have is the kind of gray area of the detention ponds um, because that could potentially change lots, number of lots. Yeah. I don't know. I, I feel like there's a couple issues here with that could change the whole number of lots on the development. One with the 10 foot um, and then another one with the detention ponds. And number three item, the 100 foot on the cul-de-sacs potentially. Yeah. All three of those could potentially change the number of lots, not even considering um, that Adams expressed the concern with being actually reaching the, the allowed density. Yeah, I, I was going to say we need to talk about density, but since Jonathan's uh, up, I think it would be good to talk about. Jonathan, do you understand what I was pointing out about the 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 road that stubs into the A1 lot, um, and that we need to address that from a turnaround? Do we allow public streets to dead end with no permanently, no way to turn around? Because I'm. If so if it allows for a turnaround, excuse me, so so we we default back to UFA's requirements on that, which is 150 feet of, um, you know, a dead end lane. It has to, needs to have a turnaround, which this does not exceed that particular length. So they have the ability to turn around um, with that intersection being less than 150 feet away. Even in a public right of way like that, where it's never going to be developed, because it I thought it was measured off the center line and it looks like it's over 150 feet off these plans. It, you know, so, and I'm, and I'm speaking, maybe I'm a little flat footed here, but I would assume that UFA's interpretation of that would be off that right away line, which they've reviewed. Um, and they did not flag that particular issue. But I'm talking the city owns that roadway and infrastructure and the fact that you're dead ending asphalt like that, won't that be a maintenance nightmare for us to, for years to come? So that's that's a good question for public work. So we could certainly bring up, but the, the point is again here that you know they they could certainly utilize that for for snowplow. I don't necessarily think it brings up a um, a deal killer issue, at least as far as that is concerned, Adam. Um, and maybe I'm speaking out of turn for them, but again, the, the the UFA essentially would govern in this particular case. I just mean the fact that you have a fence in the center of that road, almost with if you look at the potential of a fence, if you look at the I, uh, the Napa back of Napa Ridge Cove, it 
someone could put their fence right where the roadway ends. Correct. Correct. And that's how we want to do our designing of roads. Yeah, again, so that's 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 where you, you are correct, Adam. I think that idealistically you'd want to have a, a cul-de-sac or a knuckle. In this particular case, it doesn't, you know, this hasn't harmed uh, UFA's access or in any, you know, way where they would stop and not be able to turn around. All right. And I, I would like to say that just for sake of clarification, there's a big difference between a variance and a deviation to the standard. I just wanted to make sure that the Planning Commission understands that a variance is not given for an engineering standard, but rather a deviation to the standard. And that has not been granted, but rather proposed at this time. Um, anything else that you guys want me to hit on? I, I do have one more question, just looking at this area right here. So we have lot 105, which is in the um, Shoshone Estate. Um, and then we have the 10 foot snow placement easement. Is that going to cause drainage issues? Is this, I'm just wondering if this sits higher or is it going to potentially flood out some of their lot and affect some of their area? Someone might need to help me kind of help clarify with maybe a mouse or where we're looking at specifically. Um, the snow which storage. Said, which lot? Okay. The end of that road. Little like little lot six and five. <laughs> Are you talking about lot six and five? Maybe? I'm talking about, so there's a lot 24 and then right next to it is lot 105 in the other subdivision. And then right where Adam's saying where the road ends right there. So is it the one with the little mouse on it now? Um, oh, the big mouse? It's a little bit to the right lower. Oh, so you're talking about the other development. That's uh, already. Are you talking about the fence that I was talking about? Yes. So, yeah, so I think John, it's the snow oh, snow removal and where the drainage will occur is the question. If you dead end all that snow, is it going to basically go down a non-public utility easement and unexpected flow? It's basically highlighting that you probably shouldn't have a dead end like that. Well, it'll go into the yard of 105. Right. Correct. Okay. Yeah, there's I think that there's a good point there, but you know, you could have potentially a curb and gutter to catch that. To, you catch that and bring that back one other direction, but I think that's a good point to be honest. I think. All right, that might be another item that we need to make sure is. Thank you, Jonathan. Sir. What did you say our Harriman City standard is when you do a cul-de-sac versus not do a cul-de-sac? Right, over 150 feet. 150 feet. That's and that's UFAs. Yep. Uh, you keep saying UFA. I'm saying city. Ignore UFA. I know that that's what their their rules are. What is the city code? City requires currently it's a 600 feet maximum. Uh, maximum. But it it requires a cul-de-sac on any stub out, pretty much, or a flag lot. Correct. You know that's a, that's a good question. I don't think that is stated explicitly that way. Maybe Blake might have some additions there. I'm just pulling up the uh, standard plans right now for engineering. And so we we allow cul-de-sacs and we also allow um, hammerheads and a, a 60 degree Y. And so um, those are for public, though, the, the 60 degree Y and the hammerhead. Yeah, there was there's one I know of that's been approved. It's I think it's Sedona Court. Um, OK. In the Rose Basin area, and that one does have a hammerhead at the end, and it is a maintenance issue for the city. It's public. It's a public hammerhead. It's the only one I know of in the city. And we want to. We're doing that in the. You said it, so it's okay for public, and we may want to do that here, but we probably would need a hammerhead at least, right? Yeah, in in the standards, it's allowed right now. Um, so that would be the. That that's how they. Um, you know, submitted their plans was following the standards as they're published right now. So um, the Planning Commission does have the the option to ask for a different standard that's that's allowed in our standards for this but location. I don't see a hammerhead here. That's where I'm confused. Yeah, this is essentially functioning as a hammerhead, I guess you could say, is the uh, the dead end street. It, we're we're looking at that as a hammerhead. Um, functioning like a hammerhead. Hmm. Okay. 
All right, anything else, Adam or Jackson or anyone else on the Planning Commission for Jonathan? Or can we let him sit down? I think he can sit down this time. Thank you. So I was just wanting to kind of clarify on density a little bit so that our applicant can come back and understand kind of where everybody is thinking. I was leaning on, like I said earlier, that um, if I look at the numbers that we were using, our staff said that they couldn't get above a 2.5. And what I'm saying is I don't believe that the roadway would count as a density bonus. So what I'm what I'm just want to be clear with so staff understands is I don't see how we would qualify above a 2.35 density based off of all of what's been proposed at, at this time. I still could kind of argue about whether the landscape improvement would qualify, but I'm sure the developer will come up with a solution, work with staff to show that it's worth that investment. Um, but at this point, I don't see how we'd go above a 2.35 density. I wanted to hear everybody else's thoughts since um, we, we need to kind of convey that to our, our developer. And just to clarify, um, it's the one item that, that you said was 0.15. If Adam, you go to our, if you go to our staff's recommendation, like one, I think it's two slides forward or one slide back, I can't remember. <coughs> uh, but basically, they went through and they said that there was one area that you can't get a uh, when you double, you can't get an extra 0.15 or an extra two. So they they said it was 0.15. And maybe Clint can talk about that because uh, I think he was the one that pointed that out. Um, and that's why in our staff report, they had a different number of 2.5 versus 2.55. But what I'm saying is one of those does not count. So there should not be an additional 0.15. It could, uh, you could go back one, right. well. it's, it was, I'm back one before that. So one of these, correct? Correct. What I'm saying is the 143 should be part of our code in requirements. So there should not be a point two there. Uh, but if you look at what the what what our city rules are, is they should that shouldn't have been a point two anyway. Um, and so if you look at uh, Mr. Horsley's uh, estimate, 2.55, and our city staff adjusted to 2.5. So what I'm saying is it should be you could either subtract point two from Mr. Horsley's 2.55, which would be 2.35, or you could go 0.15 off of the city staff, would be 2.35. So no matter that's what, what, I don't. That's think what I, that's what I was missing, Adam. Got it. Yeah, what I don't think it's be higher than that density. But I, I wanted to kind of make sure we, as a planning staff, were were agreeing kind of in in somewhat realm, so that we don't give the applicant some ridiculous requirement. And again, I'm assuming that fee and Lou is more than landscaping improvements of detention ponds. I think there's much typically more that we require than that. And usually our developers, and I'm sure Mr. Horse is one of them, that will come back with a solution that can meet that point two justification. But at this time, I don't see a reason to go beyond, above 2.35 based off of the proposals. All right, opinions yeah. from other uh, so, commissioners so my two concerns i want to feel good about the t detention ponds that they meet the requirements because that's going to change lot sizes potentially or i mean lot numbers and the other the other item would be um that 10 foot buffer where the other owner isn't on but, board but brody both of those are issues that they can work on i'm talking about density no matter what we have to cap that what i'm saying yeah, is at this say point the application. Do you see any issue with? Are you yeah, thinking yeah. No, lower? I, I, I agree with you on what you said about density and number. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Are, are there any other opinions on the density? Um, I mean, noted uh, additional two items that Brody brought up as well, which I think are very relevant. Um, anyone else on the planning commission? Uh, are there thoughts and agreements, or that do they think that that they think they meet that requirement? I, I'm in agreement with Adam. Okay. I I would say I agree with Adam. I, I would think maybe there's some other improvements they could do that might help bring it back up. I, I don't know what I mean, that's probably something I that maybe they can figure out, but okay. And then Jonathan did have a comment. Um did you have a comment on that? No, I, I was just being on standby in case there was oh, any need. Okay. It, it appeared you guys understood the issue very well on the detention the pond. So. Okay, awesome. Yep. Yeah, Thank I mean you. one thing that Heather Heather brought up, and I think we need to look at it. I mean, 
the grading of the 12 percent i would like to see kind of a side by side like what is what does that mean a 10 percent grade versus 12 and what adjustments actually have to be made because i feel like you know maybe the 12 percent does make more sense if, if, if it provides visual. a benefit to the city then we can justify yeah, it if it's making, for further de further developments it'll make sense correct. that we justified it because of this reason right now there's no no justification of it that we can establish until we've seen the differences, I believe. Yeah, like what the, what the compromises are between those two grades. But I'm in agreement; it may make more sense. Um, but but as of right now, we don't know why um, necessarily it could, or we haven't seen a visualization of what the differences would be. Because overall, right now, our our requirement is a t no more than a 10%. And that was one need. of our biggest concerns the last time we looked at this, when it was still one long road, was Correct. that the, how steep it was so breaking it apart has helped but it's still too steep the whole reason we broke it into two roads was so you could get make it less steep correct all, all right, right. Um, and i do want to i do want to commend uh mr horsley for his work in breaking it into two roads i think that has been uh, a good uh development and I, I i agree i'd like to thank him for that yeah yeah, I like I like what I really do like what you've done. I think that I'm I'm excited to see bigger lots come into the city because we need it. And so I, we don't want to push back against this development. We want to see this development come, but we just want it to meet our codes for safety and to make sure that it's it's enjoyable for our community. So I think where you're going with this, Mr. Horsley, is great. I think you're really close. Yeah. And there's just a handful of uh, small items that need to be adjusted so they fit our standards. And so, because it really is silly, 82 foot, when you have 200 foot plus next to them, obviously you can get that to hit 85. It just doesn't say it on that. And, and so for us, it's not quite finished with some of those items as well. So. Chair, sure. you might have make a comment. Excuse me? You mind if I make a comment? Oh, absolutely, Clint. So I um, first off, I want to say I appreciate everybody that's shown up tonight, and I think that the the input that we've taken is very useful and very good. Um, I think that one of the things I could have clarified better, as a staff, we understand there's a lot of issues, right? There's a lot of concerns, there's a lot of questions still with this lot or with this subdivision, and that's something that we tried to build into the conditions of approval that all of these issues would be looked at, would be resolved in terms of. Um, you know, getting to a place where we can actually have a plot that is recordable that does meet the standards. And I don't think I maybe pointed that out well enough. In my recommendations for approval, there are several, you know, most of these issues that we've talked about tonight are addressed in that, in those conditions. And those were things that we would need to address with the applicant before, before the, act, the plot was actually recorded. Um, one thing I did want to clarify though, in terms of variances and, and you know, providing a, a, a well, a couple of things. First off, the the density bonuses that we looked at um, together with the uh, developer and as a staff, those are merely suggestions. Ultimately, and you, I think the Planning Commission understands that you are the final say in, uh, in actually assessing those and, what, you know, and you determine the merit in terms of whether they are granted a, a bonus density or not. Our, our staff report was made as, as merely a, an analysis from a staff perspective. And then, you, you know, of course, you have the, the final say in that. Um, in terms of density, or in terms of uh, the variance that was that was uh, mentioned, um, variances are not. This 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 applicant is not getting a special exception to, to have a variance. Variances are they're available to anybody that has a a property that's challenged by topography. The, the requirement is that if there is a, a condition on your property that is not self-imposed, such as topography, uh, you are you are permitted to make a request for a variance. That will go before our appeals authority. Now he'll be the final say on whether or not that, that uh, variance is approved, but that is available to anybody in the city, any developer, and, that, and this isn't some kind of exception that we're making for Mr. Horson. So. And, and I appreciate that because you did state early on, and, and I know it gets lost with all, all the process as we go through this, but you did state very, uh, very early on um, as you address this that, that these were items that had to be addressed before it it, it actually was recorded, and so um, and so. Thank you for clarifying that. Any other comments from the planning commission on this? I just have a clarif clarifying question on that. So the variance, um, 
would he need to get the variance before the plat is recorded correct? So we would have another chance to review it before, because this was. It just depends if we approve it with uh, with the requirement that they can get a variance, and the variance is then allowed to be recorded. If we say we want the variance back before we do that, then and then it's a different process. Is that correct? Correct. You could you could approve it with conditions that the applicant receive that variance. Um, if the applicant doesn't receive the variance, then he would need to meet the standard require requirement of having a 100-foot wide stall or 100-foot wide uh, parking stalls, lots. And then, uh, or if you wanted to see that again, then that would be certainly in your purview. Thank you, Clint. So we Can could... We ask... Go ahead. Uh, so How about Jackson? Yep. Okay, sorry. If we were to go... Uh, uh, I don't know how many... I think we have like 12 items to uh, look at for, uh, a, you know, that would be approved by staff. Um, we could add a requirement that the dead end, as currently shown, uh, needs to be modified so that it doesn't end in a fence. We could add that as one of our requirements. Uh, absolutely. Okay. I, I think there's so much that personally, I think we should continue it, but. I personally think there's too many items that, that need to be brought back. Um, well, I mean, the, reten the retention ponds. The retention pond is is one major one um, because it could potentially cut lots out just because it's required to, uh, uh, I guess, handle the drainage that's that's needed in that area. I mean, we could cut lots out just because of that, and that could change the fill of the entire de development. And so, um, I, I think there's enough items where there's a possibility of changing it. If there was only one item, then I think it might be a little bit easier, but with there being multiple, I think it, it needs to come back, in my opinion. Granted, uh, it's up to you guys to make a motion. So if they have to lose a lot and all the lots got rearranged, um, I'm, uh, part of what I'm thinking of, and I know it, I'm not supposed to, is everybody that's put money down. I assume somebody's probably put one on lot, they'd have to get rid of or that they would have to drop that person. But then all the other lots change, and is somebody going to want to keep that lot after it's changed? But but what we just talked about was the density we were all saying was at this point probably not going to be above 2.35. So no matter how you look at it, that's losing a lot potentially for the whole project. Yeah. So I think we can't – I hear what you're saying, Jackson, but, I mean, we, we need to come up with what we recommend independent of that whole discussion. Okay. Yeah, I think but we're all – sympathetic to the situation but that's not um what we're here for we're here for yeah, I, that I mean we're I looking at the ordinances the general plan the zoning and making sure it fits those requirements and and uh, this body that's their responsibility and, and so until it meets these requirements we've been talking about i don't think we can approve it so i'm ready to make a motion whenever everybody else is ready can I ask a question first? Absolutely, Heather. So are you, are you going to change the name of Solomon Way? I'm just thinking if I'm putting it into GPS, if I'm going to end up just going into the, the original cul-de-sac, I'm just wondering how that's going to work. They'd have to name that Solomon Cove or got Solomon. Yeah. Would they have to change it or? It's not built yet. <laughs> yeah. When it goes to a... Uh... To a cul-de-sac now, the new the county standards will require us to to put a cove or or some designation on it that shows that it's a, a no outlet street. Just as long as Google knows. Yeah, we somehow they know. I don't <laughs> I don't know how they do, but they they change it. They update. I think Sounds Salt Lake good. County sends those that those records to Google. Google. Okay, Adam, we're ready for you. All right, then if we're looking to make a motion, um, I I mean I don't think we need to reiterate depending on. It sounds like it's a continuation. So I'm gonna just gonna add a right. few. I know we've talked about a lot, but I think I summed them up pretty, pretty concise. And if Thank not, my motion. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to approve item. Uh, what is it? To three point one uh, with staffs, uh, with the following adjustments to be adjusted to continue this. Um, I think we need to address the. Hey, Adam. Wait. Adam, did you, you make a motion to continue or approve? Because you said approve. I'm sorry. I, I, let me let me restart. I I looked at like three things at once and I saw approval. So my mistake. I would like to make a motion to continue this item, without date, with a variety of things that the applicant and city staff need to address. Some of them are 
we've talked about a lot, but I just want to be clear and concise. Address the maintainable access to lot 17 by city staff and the applicant to ensure the turnaround is appropriate as well as the maintenance of that as it deads into a currently proposed potential fence. Uh, address the extension of 13400 South um, all the way to the full extent of the property and how that will be addressed. Um, adjust and evaluate all of the setbacks and lot widths along 9, 10, 11, 18, and 19, and 20. Um, demonstrate with uh, CAD design drawings why we would vary beyond our 10% or deviate beyond our 10% uh, roadway to demonstrate why that is an advantage to go uh, to a higher slope. Identify the storm drain um, and pond and location and to also, and this is a really important one for the city staff, to demonstrate that Chance Glad Hills access can be addressed in a different way so that it doesn't need to be addressed with this development. And then the final one, based off the information that we've seen, I do not see why a density bonus above 2.35 would be warranted for this project. And that is assuming that we get more than landscaping with the uh, Shoshone uh, detention pond. Um, did you want to bring up anything about the retention um, located on the property? Because I know we talked about it earlier. I said storm, uh, have them ad address the storm drain impacts. So I'm going to leave it up to that. I okay. want to see where they go. Just wanted to make sure since we talked about it. All right, motion made by Adam. I'll second. A second by Heather. And we'll call for a vote. Andrea? Yes. Lauren? Yes. Heather? Yes. Jackson? With a heavy heart, I say yes. I, I feel uh, those who have put money down, but I, I have to say yes. And I agree with you there. Adam? I, I'm with Jackson. I wish we weren't putting people in this position, but we didn't do that. So I'm going to say yes. I think that's a good qualifier, Adam. We didn't do that. And Brody? Uh, yes to that item. All right. So that was uh, voted on to be continued, and it will be left open for a public hearing. So when it does come back, um, it, the public hearing will be open for this item again. We will now move on to item 3.2, which is a request for a preliminary plot of two lots in the SLCC Juniper subdivision. And this uh, is on for a public hearing as well. And we'll start off with city staff. Sorry, just got to wipe things up real quick. That's quite all right. <clears throat> this request is much simpler. Um, so this is a request from Salt Lake Community College for a two lot subdivision uh, in a couple of different zones, the R210 and the MU zone on, uh, on 14501, 14551 Sentinel Ridge Boulevard. The applicant is Salt Lake Community College for this request. So the, the property is outlined in red here. You can see the, um, the existing lot configuration. There's a small triang triangular piece. It's also part of this that will uh, that the lot line will be adjusted. <clears throat> Essentially, there's two lots being proposed. Um, one lot um, for the community college, which is about 85 and a half acres. Um, in both the R R210 and the MU2 zone, and then Lot 2, which will be for a future um, uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints Institute building or chapel, um, and that will be located in the MU2 zone. So this is the lots being shown here. Uh, the, the interesting um, configuration of this of this proposed uh, subdivision shows that Lot 2 is with entirely within lot one and typically under city standards we require all lots to have city frontage onto uh, a public or onto a street and because the community college is an entity of the state they are exempt from subdivision design um, however they're not exempt from the plat process so we'll get into that a little bit more so same things that we're looking at here we looked at previously general plan compliance zoning compliance and engineering compliance as well uh, in terms of engineering, there are public improvements that will be required along with this plat. 
and those uh, requirements will be determined by the city engineer um, as, as part of the recordation of, of the plat. Uh, in terms of general plan, the general plan does show this property as being um, a place for public, institutional, or schools. So there's obviously compliance with the, the general plan here. And then in terms of, zone, of zoning compliance, like I mentioned before, typically the ordinance does require that all lots have frontage onto a street. Um, where they are exempt from subdivision design, uh, staff would at least recommend that the, um, well, we would recommend that, that lot two is provided frontage onto a street. If that's, not, uh, if that's not something that can be done or is desired by the applicant, then at least ensure that the public access easement uh, to that lot uh, can comply with public street and public and oh, public street uh, street widths, which would be uh, also determined by the the city engineer. Uh, with that being said, a uh, very short presentation. We do recommend that this be approved uh, with the with the requirements that the conditions be met. First, that the uh, the city or well, the applicant provide um, all bonding required for public improvements is required by the city engineer and then the work with staff on the proposed access easement from Rail Vista Drive, and then any other staff comments are obtained and satisfied before recordation. Any All right, thank questions you. Questions for me? Any questions for uh, uh, city staff? <clears throat> All right, seeing none, then uh, if the applicants here from Salt Lake Community College, then if they have any additional comments. And for some reason, I think this may have been the second or third meeting where it occurred we had a, a bit of length before you guys. <laughs> and so I apologize for that. Oh, that's okay. Uh, my name is Tyson Gregory. Um, I work for Salt Lake Community College, so I'll be representing them. Um, the only other thing I would kind of add to that is we do want to keep the plot where we have it at. We want to keep continuity along the frontage road there of Real Vista and have that so that we are able as the community college to maintain that and, and design that to our landscaping designs that we we have in place. Um, and that's part of the reason why we have that, that set back into that. Um, the road that you see going into that um, in the agreement that we have with the church, there is that access easement um that is included into that so that will be part of the the process of when we close uh, the road then will continue up and around and into our parking lots and that road and the parking lot and all that will be done um, when our construction of our buildings are, is being completed so that that will be all completed and done before the church even starts building their institute uh, building on that on that lot um, What else? Oh, included in that, there will be a, um, a utility easement that we will have, uh, that they will have from us to get out to Real Vista to, to include their um, utility hookups too. Um, I think. Um, oh, the one other update when we had our DRC meeting last week or two weeks ago, the question was asked about the funding of the project for Salt Lake Community College. We did just get word this past Friday that that has been approved by the legislature. So our plan is to start um, no later than July on construction of, of all the stuff, so. All right, any questions for the applicant? I just had a general question. So there's an extension at the old city hall. Will you keep that too? Uh, as soon as we are done with the completion of our building there, we will be moving out of the old city hall and that will go back to the Harriman city. Right. We, we appreciate the great relationship we've had with Harriman city and, and what we've been able to work there. So that, that's been awesome. All right, thank, thank you. you. Any other questions for the applicant? I just have a question. So under our design standards um, 
on the staff report. It's asking for the easement to be changed to an access easement in favor of lot two. Do you feel like if um, we were to approve, I guess this question is more for staff. <laughs> if we were to approve it, does your recommendation um, mirror what you laid out above with the access easement in favor of lot two? So you're saying, I'm sorry. So in our, if you look under design standards, um, it says in here, the easement currently calls out for a vehic vehicular access easement uh, and staff recommends that the easement be changed to an access easement in favor of lot two. Yes. Do we need to add anything to our, oh, I'm sorry. I was looking at something totally different guys under that. That's okay. Um, any other questions for the applicant? All right, you can have a seat if you like. Um, if you wanna come back up after the public hearing, I will, I will let you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so at this time, we'll open the public hearing. And uh, Wendy, do we have any public comments? No? Okay, so. My name is Steve Chestnut. I'm a resident there on Fawn Hill Lane, so I back up against this property. We've been trying to find what the plan is for this development and have been unable to find that. So we'd like to know what it is that's being developed here. Because as, as we got the notification, it was very unclear what was being proposed. So that my request is that we, we somehow somebody helps us understand exactly what is being proposed that's being developed that's adjacent to the Bond Hill Lane development. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? All right, seeing no other comments, we will close this public hearing at this point and turn to the Planning Commission. And I'll, I'll sort of answer, as of right now, we're recording the plot. Salt Lake Community College owns this plot. Um, as you heard, they voiced that there will be a additionary seminary building that will go in that second plot. Um, they will at a later time bring back exactly how it's laid out and what it entails. And so at this point, it's just recording the plot. But we don't have we don't have a lot of jurisdiction on them, just to be clear to everybody. Yes. But, but I, they, I, they tend to do a really good job. They tend to do a really good job. So I, I googled what if you go to the master plan. I mean, this is for everybody in the planning commission. I'm addressing this to, and and the person that voiced it. You can go look at their master plan, and it actually looks pretty cool. So um, I would suggest all of us looking at that. Um, if you just go to Salt Lake Community and go to their master plans, there's one called Harriman, and you can see exactly their plans. But again, we can't really do anything on their control and design and layout of that. And that could still change before it comes back and things like that. So, um, all right. Um, any comments or discussion on this item from the Planning Commission? Oh, if the applicant wants to come back up, he is more than willing to come back up and if he has additional comments he would like to do at this time. And uh, most of it's already been said, you know, you, you go to uh, slcc.edu and you can see a lot of the master plans on there. Um, we don't currently have anything of the, the building we're gonna be building there, uh, any views or pictures of that. Uh, that that's something we could definitely look at. Um, and yeah, it, it's just starting to build out a whole campus there on that whole lot, so. All right, thank you. Thank you. No additional comments or discussion from the Planning Commission or um, if they're ready to make a motion at this time. Yeah, I'm ready to make a motion. All right, Brody. Um, I'd like to make a motion <clears throat> to approve the prelim preliminary plat of two lots in the SLCC Juniper subdivision with staff's three recommendations. Motion by Brody. Okay. Uh, second by Adam, and we'll call for a vote. Andrea? Yes. Lauren? Yes. Heather? Yes. Jackson? I abstain. Oh, thank you. Adam? 
Yes. And Brody. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, that was approved with uh, five votes. Yes, one one um, individual abstained from voting. Uh, we'll move on to item four, which is just additional comments from the the chair or commission. Adam, I have two. We need to really address, and I'd like Blake to t tell us when we'll be doing this discussion. We need to really address when uh, we will be. Okay, hold on, Adam. Thank you, Salt Lake Community College. Sorry. Go ahead, Adam. We we really need to address when we will be doing the um, discussion on redevelopment. I think we saw some of that today, some of the confusion behind that, um, the ability to sell off land quick claim style, but we need to have be able to tie that back uh, for other developments. So I'd like to, uh, Blake to maybe maybe next time we meet, at least be able to have you address what we're doing towards that discussion. And then the other one I would really like to talk about is, I think we need to soften the way we, I know we all know that city staff's recommendations are only staff's recommendations, but applicants always wanna use that as, well, your staff approved it, so we should, you know, by golly, you're required to approve it. So we need to we need to figure out some verbiage there to make sure people understand, even a little caveat saying. I'll, I'll try at the beginning of the meetings, Adam, to express that a little bit better too. No, I, I think that's for the applicants because the staff gives the applicants their recommendations before we even talk. Yeah. And I think that's the confusion is they they assume that that's the only rules in, of engagement. So I, I think we just need to think about that a little bit. Okay. Um, the only other item I have on this well, I, uh, at this time is a quick note. Oh, go ahead, Jackson. I'm I'm often on the other side uh, of that equation. Uh, you know, bringing things into cities. I think it does help to have that that staff approval. I think it you know uh, as you work through things, getting the staff approval I think is important. So I think what the staff our staff is doing is right, but uh, uh, making sure that everybody's aware that you know because the staff recommends it doesn't mean the city uh council or planning commission is going to recommend or approve it so i, I think it's, i think it is the right thing to do that that's all i'm saying is making sure we highlight staff highlights that that i know they do but maybe putting that somehow saying subject to or something like that yeah all right um, the only other item I wanted to address here, and I think we talked about it earlier, is there's a handful of ordinances that probably need a little clarification. Um, I'll take, um, as we talked about buffering uh, between uh, different areas with uh, half acre lots and things like that, um, we may want to clarify a little bit in the language um, what the intentions are there um, so that, that it's not left up to as much um, differing opinions as we've gotten. It sounds like there's probably two or three uh, different ordinances that fall in that category. I know we mentioned a couple of them tonight. Um, we probably just want to look over them. Uh, hopefully we took notes because there's no way I could tell you which ones they are again now, except for that one. And so, um, and I think it's really minor changes. It's not really anything major. And so, um, hopefully we can look at it and address that a little bit. Um, I appreciate city staff a lot. And so I know how hard you guys work. I really do. And I appreciate your comments, Clint, today, because um, I, I think exactly what you said sometimes is viewed as that's what staff wants. And it's it's not exactly what they want. They're basing it on how they look at things and recommendations and, and then bring it to the, the planning commission. And so I appreciate a lot of your comments on how that works. Um, is there... I meant to also say I really wanted to thank staff on the way they presented tonight. I really liked the way we went through the approach of all of the projects. I really appreciate that. Thank you. And I did notice as well, seeing all the city staff come up to the podium, it definitely is more professional when they present. And so I did notice that we haven't done that for a while. Um, usually we're all sitting when we present from the city staff. And so I do think that's the, it, it did. It was noticeable. And so. Um, any other comments from the planning commission? Uh, just a quick one uh, back on the doors for the uh, <laughs> for the departments. Uh, it does meet code, uh, and I was aware of what I said when I did it. That uh, what it uh, did is it closed off the breezeway. By closing off the breezeway, breezeway it makes what is called an internal shaft, and an internal shaft is something you can handle. You just have to add a, an exhaust fan. 
uh, you know, and make sure that all of your fire rating requirements are met. They apparently didn't want to add a fan. And so uh, my worry at this point is I could see the HOA for the, these condos come in someday and try and install some ugly gates in these same locations for security purposes. So hopefully we don't end up with a bunch of ugly gates in there. I'm happy that you said something because one day when I drove by, I was like, I swear those were not in the plan and I've been meaning to go back and look, but they didn't look very good. So I'm glad that you noticed that. <laughs> That was one thing I was going to ask. Is only because we approved it that way? As we did our research, it was not a requirement of the development. They they chose to do it. Um, I think it was a comment. It was discussed as all I could find um, listening did. to the yeah. meetings. And so they put them on, and then um, our building official and our our residential building inspector um, noted that they did not meet code because. The way they're configured, they have to have two. Uh, the breezeway has to be open on both ends, is what I heard from our building official. And then, um, as I as I talked to them, I said, "Can they put up some raw iron or some type of gate?" And the way the code reads is it has to be structural and it can't impede ingress egress. So I don't anticipate there's any ability for them to put any type of gate or anything on there. It's going to have to remain open to to meet the fire code. Okay. Right. Thank you. And Jackson, I like the corners of the buildings, and I, I, I think you contributed to that. <laughs> it turned out good. It looks good. Yeah, it looks nice. And so, um, future meeting. Oh, any additional comments? Okay. Future meetings, Wednesday, March 10th, 2021, City Council meeting. Thursday, March 18th, 2021, Planning Commission meeting. Wednesday, March 24th, 2021, City Council meeting. Uh, motion to adjourn? So moved. All in favor? Aye. Thank Aye. you so much, guys. Andrea, are you good with this? <laughs> I know. We, we don't get the same effect when the, everybody's not in person. Thank you so much, guys.